And welcome everybody to Inside D2 Football. We've got our entire crew here. Uh, Brandon Meisner, I'm your host. We've got uh, Justin Polizzi, conference or excuse me, playoff winning coach Justin Polizzi. Chuck Bittner is uh, <laughs> is uh, joining us. South Atlantic Con or conference columnist Devin Albertson, MIAA columnist Matt Whitwicky, NSIC columnist, and uh, Chris Ferguson is our CIAA columnist, but as you guys know, we are Jacks, uh, all Jacks of, uh, of all trades. So uh, we got a lot to talk about tonight, guys. Uh, six teams ranked in the top 25 poll lost this week. We will uh, talk about some of those. Uh, we got one more week to go before the playoffs are selected, and uh, uh, we'll look at how those things look in this moment if the playoffs were to start next week. Uh, we'll look at the regional rankings, what we think they will be tomorrow, as well as how the playoffs would look if the regional rankings uh, were used. Uh, we'll also talk about some Harlan Hill candidates. It's that time of year. Maybe we've uh, uh, whittled it down a little bit to see who, who might uh, be a candidate for the Harlan Hill trophy. Uh, but tonight, uh, we start with a matchup of uh, two ranked PSAC teams, uh, undefeated Cal U and one loss Slippery Rock. So, Chuck, uh, Slippery Rock had uh, – uh, beat previously undefeated Cal 38-26. to 26. They win the PSAC West. Uh, they raced out to an early 21-point, uh, 21-0 uh, first quarter lead. They never trailed in the ball game. So uh, Noah Grover made just a second start in a Slippery Rock uniform and had another huge day uh, after winning the D2Football.com Player of the Week last week. He uh, threw again for 466 and only, only four touchdowns. Uh, this time, and uh, the win secured Slippery Rock's third straight PSAC West title. Uh, they'll play at Kutztown next week uh, in the PSAC Championship. So it looks like a great win for the Rock, but uh, it, it you know it wasn't as easy as, as some might have thought. Well, it was a really interesting game to watch because I think if you just saw the final score, it was probably a, about what people might have expected. Uh, but really, I don't, I don't think the game was as close as that. Uh, the Slippery Rock really had had control of this game, really from start to finish. California had had some moments. They responded well when when they ended up in a twenty one point deficit, and you expect a good team to do that. Right. They had their moments, and and they made some things happen. But uh, Slippery Rock really was in control of this game. They had, they had a couple of missed opportunities uh, right at the end of the half where they could have really put a put a dagger through the heart of California. Uh, and possibly had this game wrapped up at, at halftime. And then when you get into the second half, they they really had to battle a lot of adversity ag against some uh, some really questionable officiating. I'll, I just have to say, <laughs> and I hate to I hate to start there, but um, uh, there there were a couple of possessions where the the officials really just were were so <laughs> so happy to throw penalty flags anytime California put the ball in the air, and and, and they really had to work against that, and it's it's challenging to overcome that. And, and it can really get in your head as a defense when you feel like the refs are out to get you, even though that's, that's not really the case. So it was a, a difficult second half. They had to battle through that. And, and at the end of the game, you know, when you can walk away from that with a, a 38, 26 win, you feel really good about that. They win the PSAC West again, that's three in a row and, and seven in, in 10 years, which is pretty remarkable because that West division in the PSAC is really, really competitive. There's, there's some juggernauts in that league that they have to contend with. So that that's a pretty remarkable stat in, in itself. Right, Chuck. Uh, again, it was a 38-26 win for Slippery Rock over uh, Cal U. Let's bring on the head coach of Slippery Rock. Sean Lutz joins us. Coach, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate you having me here. Guys, I'm honored. Uh, seriously, I'm honored. Uh, you guys do a great job, and and, and to get the publicity, uh, you know, publicity for D2 football is awesome. So I'm honored. Thanks for having me tonight. Well, thank you. thank you for being here. So you know, it's it's a great win for you over undefeated Cal. Uh, the fast start you had had them playing behind all day. As a coach, I got to think that's a huge factor in the game. Yeah, to start off fast the way we did, we we knew getting a home game and uh, playing a team like California. I mean, you look at their statistics going in the game, they had a number one pass offense in the country, and they were top five in all defensive categories. What we were trying to do at the beginning of the game is get it to our playmakers. Um, you know, the Jermaine wins, the Henry Litt wins, the St. Hugh Sweetings, quick passes, get it going early and often uh, to get up in this type of game. And we did that, so we, we battled and – and it feels real good to get back in that PSAC championship game this coming Saturday. 
Hey, Coach, to my novice eyes, it, it really looked like there were some interesting battles of, of coaching adjustments in this game because early on, you guys were doing a great job of getting at Cal quarterback Noah Mitchell, and, and then they were able to adjust to that, let him get a little bit more comfortable, and he was moving around in the pocket a little bit. And then at halftime, your, your staff counters their adjustments, and, and you do a great job getting at them again in, in, the, in the third quarter and, and into the fourth quarter as well. So can you talk us through how your, your staff was adjusting to, to getting pressure on him and keeping him uncomfortable all day? Yeah, number one, they run a lot of RPOs, so they're going to throw the ball really quick. And, and Chuck, uh, I think he's the hottest quarterback in the country going in this game. The throws he's been making, those receivers, have been unreal. They, they haven't rushed the football very well, so we're trying to do a little bit more with coverage, but they were throwing the ball quick. So we're a little bit, I, I'm not going to say unorthodox, but we press up receivers. So if you could press guys up and he has to hold the ball a little bit longer, um, you know, we get more time to get pressure on the quarterback. So we wanted to, you know, give up a little less in the run game, made that adjustment and really defend that pass, you know, but with press coverage, you know, we had some one-on-one -on -one balls that, you know, that a lot of flags got thrown that way too. But, um, you know, I was really pleased with, we created some turnovers and, and, and it's not about sacking the quarterback. It's just getting pressure on him, trying to make him make bad decisions. Yeah. So talking about penalties, and, and I, I'd hate to make this such a feature factor of the game, but it really did become uh, an issue later in the game. I was just kind of wondering if from a coach, and obviously your job is to work the officials and, and, and deal with that situation, but how do you coach the players to that? Because you really need to keep them focused and move on to the next play. Yeah, I mean, halftime was eight to zero, but, uh, you know, I don't, you know, like you said, I, I can't comment too much on the fish, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it's just the fact that you got to overcome that. But when you get a big time game, you know, we respect Kyle like crazy, you know, you, you just, in those type of games, you don't want a lot of the flags being thrown and stuff like that. But every time I turn around, you know, we, we had one where we stopped them in the red zone on that drive. I think there was six penalties on that drive we end up getting a stop on the drive it finally gets up i think there was four straight pass interference calls and you know some of them were good but it, it is you just got to keep going moving forward we we use that word all the time in our program be relentless and no matter what we do the guys were relentless and you know and our thing guys we really learn I, sometimes you have failures and and for us to lose the iup mm -hmm. uh we, we the margin for error in division two you you can't lose a lot of right. games and i think a lot of programs, you got to learn from that. You know, we did learn from that. That made us a little bit hungrier. It, it, it turned a failure, what we got to do better. And I really think we're playing at our best right now. And, you know, I'm looking forward to this upcoming Saturday as well. All right. So speaking about that loss to IUP, and then you had a sluggish performance at, at Mercyhurst. Noah Grover's come in and, and has done a great job two weeks in a row for you. Uh, what, what scenario, what, what, what was the decision-making process that having him play? Well, just to give you this quick stat, 2018, uh, Roland Rivers wasn't our starting quarterback until two injuries. So he was actually our third team guy and he won the Harlan Hill. So I don't know what I'm doing. There's a trend going on. At Slip <laughs> I, I think I'm not doing a very good job with the quarterback situations. No, but, you know, to, to Andrew Kester was our starting quarterback. But we, we just thought that, you know, we need a little different change. And Noah comes from North Dakota. I'm proud of saying he's an engineering student with a 4.0 oh, nice. GPA. And he can really read defense as well. And he's very smart. He's intelligent. And, he, you know, he's not panicking back there. But it's real easy, guys. And I'm not just – I think we have the best receiver combination, three guys in the country right now in, in Litwin, Wynn, and SynQ Sweeting. And to me, just get it out quick, those guys. In that game, we call it yak, yards after catch. They made so many explosive plays. And, and to me, just make good decisions. Get it out to those playmakers as quick right. as you can. Yeah, I think one of the things that really stood out to me, and, and actually there's a few Cal players that, that really made this game fun to watch too, the contested catches that, that those guys can make. Uh, you know, we saw some of the explosive plays that they, that they make in open space, but it's a, Litwin especially, just the contested catches and the instincts to come back to the quarterback when he's in trouble and you know shield off defenders with his body is just remarkable. It, having three of those guys, that, that's got to be – I mean, how, how do you actually kind of game plan to make sure that you use those three? I mean, we talk about Litwin a, a lot, but the other two guys both had over 160 yards receiving on Saturday. Well, Coach Nugenbauer, our offense coordinator, does a great job. Let's not, let's not make this real fancy than it has to be. Everybody talks come and scheme and all that stuff. Let We call it dudes. Let's get the ball <laughs> to your dudes. And on his script, he has those guys' name, 
and you got to find ways, you know, where we struggled at and in the IUP game and the Mercer's game, we weren't getting the ball to what we call our dudes. Sorry, that's a term that we use. And to me, don't make this that hard. Get it to your best players and, and let them make plays. And, um, you know, I'm also proud Henry Litwin is a finalist for the Walter Trophy Award that he's going to Las Vegas for. He's getting a postgraduate scholarship of 18000 So, And we've had every NFL team in to look for him. Right. So I think he could have a chance to get on an NFL roster, even maybe Jermaine Wynn and some Q Sweeting as well. Definitely. Well, this win puts you right back in familiar territory. You're going to the PSAC championship game. Give us uh, some of your initial thoughts about uh, traveling to take on nine and one Kutztown. It's a weird season. I mean, it's, 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 it's been some ups and downs, you know, 2019, I'm trying to get that right. Cause we didn't play 2020, but uh, it was a lot easier. This one's been hard. You know, we're just trying to, you know, we got an experienced football team. 16 of our seniors came back based on the pandemic. So we have a veteran football team and we're very grateful and we are going to play uh, relentless style football and you know going to Kutztown we we that game in, in 2019 we had to pull through at the end to win that so we know we know there's a chance if we would lose that game you know it, we you know whatever happens if we could get in the national playoffs so we're we're viewing since the IUP game to be honest with you with every every game left is a playoff game so we got to go and play well against Kutztown let me turn awesome. my lights back on yeah. here. They all have, there we go. Sorry well, about that. I, I, that was, was kind of weird, guys. I, I was going to make a comment. At least we know that uh, Slippery Rock is energy efficient, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, they're not, maybe they didn't pay the bills or nothing. But, yeah. <laughs> Very yeah good. I, I, guys, I, I'll say this. I think Jim Clements and I, it, with the you know the resources they have over there, is one of the best coaches in all of Division II. I mean, their resources aren't as big as other people. He, to, they lost a lot of guys offensively. He just finds a way to reload those guys. So I have a lot of respect for Coach Clements and what he does over at Kutztown. So it's just be a great game, and it, it's great that it's a rematch. But wish it was at our place. But we'll go to Kutztown. We're not going to complain. Right, yeah, it's you. interesting. You know, when when we did our our preseason show, we talked about Slippery Rock, and and we loved what we were looking at from a roster point of view because there was so much experience coming back on this team. And then we looked at Kutztown. It was like we don't know anything about this Kutztown team. Exactly right. Coach Clements himself even said, "You know, I, I don't really know. I don't have much coming back." And yet here you both are. And and Brandon's heard me talk about. Uh, I'm really high on Jim Clements too. He does an amazing job with his resources. So it's going to be a fun game. All right, Coach. Well, we wish you the best of luck in that game, and. Uh, Hopefully we'll uh, we'll see you in the playoffs and uh, the best of luck to uh, Slippery Rock football the rest of the way out. Guys, I really appreciate it. And Chuck, uh, you did a great job with the PSAC conference. I think you kind of really spearheaded that, even though you're, you know, you gave all your props to Bloomsburg. I understand <laughs> that, you know, but but uh, we really appreciate you and we miss you. And, and uh, I wish all you guys best of luck. So thanks for having me on. I'm really honored. Thank, Thank you, you very coach. much, Coach. All right, that was Sean Lutz, the head coach at uh, – Slippery Rock and his uh, his team is uh, in the PSAC championship uh, this uh, this Saturday against Kutztown. Uh, let's switch to the NSIC. We bring back Matt. Uh, Matt, uh, Minnesota Duluth. Uh, uh, none of us picked this. In our picking, we all went five for Augie, and uh, Minnesota Duluth wins forty-one to fifteen. They were, uh, you know, Augustana was seeking out the top spot. Uh, in Super Region 4 with the win, uh, but the, the Bulldogs obviously had something else in mind. Uh, six turnovers they forced against Augustana. Um, UMD is on their third-string quarterback, Garrett Olson. Uh, as you know, and we've talked about, John Larson had suffered uh, an injury earlier in the season, and uh, uh, the win, surprisingly, is going to keep Duluth in the playoff hunt. And it might land them on the seven line uh, in Monday's regional rankings. Uh, I, but I got a question for you, Matt, because you would be more qualified to answer this than I would. Uh, when Larson came in and mop up duty, the announcers in the game, uh, they made a big deal about him to being able to throw a forward pass. And he had a big brace on his arm. And so I've got to think that, uh, uh, you know, that the injury is pretty significant to him, but, you know, to, to, to look at the bigger picture, did you know, with Larson Hurt and with the third string quarterback, did you see them as being able to pull off this kind of upset? Yeah, I have the identical read that you did with that, Brandon, where okay. you know, you're you're watching the, the fourth quarter of the game and all of a sudden the 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 former starting quarterback, John Larson, comes in to close out the contest 
And you're thinking, well, then why are they starting a third stringer? Right. Well, Larson's got a massive, uh, you know, brace on his le- right elbow. So obviously he's not able to throw the ball down the field. And they're basically just doing handoffs and other little runs. And they had talked about that he had learned how to do an option. And um, so so the local media has kind of had this under deep cover and, and aren't speaking much about it up there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, John Larson, the starting quarterback for UMD, has been out for the last month ever since. Uh, he, he got an injury midway through the Wayne State game, which was some time ago that we even spoke about. Right. So, you know, that all said, uh, Garrett Olson, the third string quarterback, frankly, hasn't had uh, much success uh, in 2019 in this type of role and also this year. Um, so, I was frankly not expecting a whole lot out of UMD on this day. And the fact that they end up winning 41 to 15 was absolutely shocking, to be frank. And uh, I thought maybe they could compete, but they were able to go ahead and kind of hit on a lot of the Augie right. pain points and uh, potentially, you know, rattling a quarterback and, 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 and being able to go ahead and hit some big plays. And uh, so it, it ended up being a, a real, a real big game in Super Region 4. Okay, well, let's go ahead, Matt, and uh, kind of take a look at how things played out in this game. Yeah, you know, you, you take a look right away. UMD brings a, brings a blitz. Uh, five-man pressure gets to gets to Kyle Sadler to the point where now he's getting uh, getting a big pass rush. He doesn't see a defender and uh, g- gets hit with a pick six right here. Uh, they're already down 6 nothing on the scoreboard. Then this score puts them down two, uh, two, two touchdowns. And all of a sudden, it's one of those where you're looking at the screen going, <laughs> is this really happening? Right. Uh, so it was a bit of a shocker there. Then, uh, you know, Nate Pearson gets around the edge, gets a strip sack there. They get the ball in the red zone, Duluth does. And all of a sudden, they're in business again right away in the first quarter. Uh, nice play here, fake jet to the to the left, and they go ahead and throw for a score. And once again, now they're up 20-0. Uh, Augustana, you know, Uh, finally does get something going here. They hit a deep route uh, right there to Devin uh, Jones to to get themselves back going. And you're thinking, okay, maybe Augustan is going to make a little bit of a run here and get things back and going. And, you know, Duluth just just keeps making plays. There's a a quarterback run right here. They're five wide. The middle's wide open. Great call by by Chase Vogler, their their offensive coordinator, former star quarterback for the program. He made a run he made a run exactly like that against Northwest Missouri in the in the 2010 semifinals to win it. Yeah, it was, and there you go, right? And then and yeah. then Joe Cordes, former USD uh, University of South Dakota linebacker, he he just comes ball thrown right to him. Frankly, uh, you know, Sadler yeah. overshoots his man. Uh, the fourth pick of the day uh, for Kyle Sadler. Two of them go for for pick sixes, and you know, Sadler was a guy that we were talking about. Uh, not that long ago as being one of the better quarterbacks in Division II football this year. He was third in, in touchdown passes. And uh, it was really an untimely bad performance uh, once again. Uh, he you know he struggled a little bit against Sioux Falls in spots and threw a big pick late. Uh, and in this game here, uh, you know, the four turnovers, then obviously the strip sack uh, kind of told the story. And, and the UMD offense didn't have to do a ton because they were able to produce so much otherwise. All right. Well, um, what do you think this does in terms of the playoff picture and the, and the conference title for that matter? Um, explain how that process works, uh, at least in terms of the conference title and how you think it's, uh, it's going to play out. Well, the, keep in mind, the, as you take a look, there, there's a North and South division. Right. Right. Uh, so Bemidji State is in all likelihood going to win the North. The South is probably going to be a split, uh, you know, where you're going to have Sioux Falls and Augustana both awarded because uh, there's not a head-to-head decision right. being made there. Uh, but, you know, furthermore, there's a real good chance that you end up seeing all three Northern Sun teams that could very well make the dance. Uh, Augustana still should stay in the rankings. Bemidji State's going to move on up uh, because of the fact they had a nice win against Northern State. And Duluth, obviously, getting this win, uh, they could very well end up on that seven line. Uh, but you you do run the risk of uh, no Northern Sun teams hosting a, a playoff game either. Sure. 
Well, uh, again, uh, that's a conference looking to get three in. And uh, let's switch back to the Northeast and look at a conference maybe trying to get two teams in. Joining us now is Paul Falowitz, the dean of all the columnists on D2Football.com. Paul, it's it's wonderful to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me on the show, and uh, now you're starting to show my age. <laughs> hey, it's better than the alternative, brother. <laughs> so, uh, New Haven, yesterday, uh, I picked Bentley. I thought they were going to win, but New Haven, uh, the defense had a great day against the Bentley offense, and the New Haven offense, you know, uh, controlled the, the line of scrimmage, ran for 286 yards, and uh, New Haven – wins uh, the Northeast 10. Uh, tell, tell us your impression of the game. New Haven, uh, right from the first uh, start, just took control. They went on a, a nine-minute, 80-yard uh, drive to score. Um, the offensive line has five graduate students. They just completely dominated a very good front line for Bentley. Um, they were ne- not able to get any pressure whatsoever. Um, they opened up huge holes for the running backs. And as you said, they just ran the ball down their throat and um, pretty much took care of everything they needed to take care of. So, um, you know, New Haven won the league. It's the first league title in nine years, which is very surprising. Um, a lot of kids came back, fifth-year seniors, uh, with everything with COVID last year. And, uh, you know, their goal was to win the league, and uh, they achieved their goal this year. Uh, in your preseason um, in your preseason predictions, how did you think the league was going to play out and what's been different than what you thought would happen? I mean, I was kind of in the, you know, with everything with COVID that happened last year, I didn't really make any picks early on because you didn't know what everyone was going to happen. Everyone hadn't played against each other. Nobody hit each other. Um, you know, no helmets cracked for a good two years. So it was really tough to figure out. But, you know, New Haven had the experience. Um, they had a lot of kids that came back. They Again, they all had this goal of doing this, uh, you know, winning this title. Um, and it, it came through for them. And they, um, you know, they, they do a very good job now with a lot of the D2 schools of bringing that fifth-year transfer in. Um, and they got a lot of good ones from Division One schools, and you know they proved it on the field, which is really what you have to do at this point. Hey, Paul, for for people that don't know the Northeast Ten all that well, uh, tell, tell us what it's like to see a, a big game at Delacamara Stadium in November with a packed house there. It, it can get pretty loud, and I know it doesn't look like a big stadium, but it gets uh, it gets pretty loud down in the, the little cutout in the woods where it is on on the blue turf. I've, I've been to a couple of playoff <laughs> games there, and it, it's a pretty great environment for uh, for Division II football. Yeah, I mean, it's probably one of the best environments in the Northeast 10. Um, you know, they have a lot of loyal fans. Um, they have a lot, a lot of loud, loyal fans. Um, they have the only band in the conference that plays at halftime, so it kind of brings you that big-time feel when you're there. Um, and then the blue field just kind of brings a different, 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 different atmosphere as well. So um, a lot of them, you know, a lot of their schools that go there, you know, get intimidated when they play down there. New Haven always has a good team, is always in the top of the league. And they do a very good job, you know, recruiting, getting the right kids there. And, you know, the coaches have done a great job over the years. And, you know, they're always near the top. And, you know, it's, it's just a great atmosphere. I mean, it's something where, you know, you're there and you just can't – you have to experience it to be there. You, I know you've been there a couple of uh, times. I stood next to you during one of those games years ago. And, um, you know, it's a very good environment. And, you know, it's what you want for that small college football field that, uh, that we all love. All right. Well, we got a couple of uh, a couple of teams that are in contention to make the playoffs. I know that would make Northeast Ten yes. fans really happy. It's been a quiet couple of years, really, since Assumption had a couple of really good teams. Uh, so, tell us what's coming up this week for both New Haven and Bentley. Obviously, we have no automatic bids, so they they both still have to earn their way into the playoffs. What's coming up for both of those teams? Uh, New Haven uh, will have will play the toughest winless team that they'll play all season in Franklin Pierce, uh, who's uh, <laughs> two years into the league. Um, you know, it's been close. They played a couple overtime games this year. Uh, played um, New Haven very tough in the first week of the season. Um, you know, New Haven is the better team on paper. Again, they should win. But as any coach is going to say, anything can happen on the field. So um, New Haven was in this situation back in 2010. They were one game away from the playoffs and lost the last week um, and then didn't make the playoffs. And Bentley's got the same thing. Bentley's got a tougher game to play Assumption, um, who's in third place in the league, right, uh, tied for third place in the league right now. So um, and again, with the Northeast 10 and some of the scheduling issues they've had over the years, this is the second time everybody's playing each other. So, um, you know, you have that game on tape, plus you have all the rest of the season. So, you know, strange things happened in that last week. And there's been a lot of upsets in that last week in the Northeast 10 over the years. And, um, you know, Assumption was an undefeated team and Bentley walked in there the last week of the year and beat them. So um, when they made a deep playoff run. So as, as we all know, games are won on the field. They're not won in, uh, in our columns at the end of the day. So, uh, Paul, what are your thoughts on how many Northeast 10 
10 teams get in. I know Chuck I, uh, talked about it a little bit. We talked about it before the show. What is the likelihood, at least in your opinion? I think two teams are in if they both win this weekend. So, um, But what's happening in the uh, Super Region 1 is that you've got right now seven teams with one loss. So, And then you have a potential team that's going to potentially get earned access. So you get eight teams for seven slots. So um, there's going to be an unhappy team here uh, come Sunday uh, afternoon next week. So um, you know, I'm hoping that the Northeast 10 gets two. Uh, New Haven, um, you know, should win this week. Bentley should be favored. Um, you know, they should win as well. If both of those win, I feel like both of them are in, and I feel like at least one of them will get at least a whole playoff game. And you know, now with uh, only one team getting a bye now, um, you know, one of those probably going to have to go on the on the road. And um, you know, hopefully we get two teams and we can come back to kind of the glory days of the NE10 when they did get two teams and, and made a little noise here in the uh, Super Region One. All right. Well, Paul, uh, again, you are the dean of D2 columnist. And, you know, I wanted I want to publicly thank you for everything that you've done. You've been you've done a, a tremendous job covering both the Northeast region and the the, the Northeast 10. And uh, I just I'm really proud and really happy that you're part of our organization. And thanks. for Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, thanks for the time, guys. All right. Thanks, Paul. All right. It's Paul Followitz, Northeast 10 columnist. Uh, so we've uh, we've gone from the Northeast uh, to, I guess, the, the Great Plains. Let's go down to the not-so-Great Plains of uh, Missouri and Kansas and Devon. Uh, Washburn uh, comes away with a 28-26 victory at Pittsburgh State, a, a back-and-forth game. Uh, Pittsburgh State quarterback Max Sexton did not play in the second half for Pitt, but Really, I think that the, the story of the game is uh, two block field goals and uh, five turnovers. And, uh, uh, you know, Washburn had the ball down at the Pitt State five with about three minutes left, fumbled. Pitt State drove it down and, uh, you know, unfortunately for them had a, a field goal blocked that would have won the game for them. So uh, it's just that kind of game. Yeah, for sure. I got there uh, pretty much right at kickoff. I got to see uh, Pitt State block a Washburn field goal on their opening drive. So, okay, this is going to be a fun little game. And then uh, Pitt State comes back, throws an interception. Washburn returns it inside the 10-yard line. Uh, is able to punch in a couple plays later. Uh, so, Washburn got a little big momentum boost there early on. And then you see here with uh, Washburn back on offense, they fumble it um, on a reception. And then Pitt State returns it for a touchdown to really flip the – tie to the game a bit and get Pitt State back in the ball game because they were kind of teetering there for Washburn uh, pulling away. And you can see this touchdown catch right here, a uh, really good receiver for Washburn, had a couple touchdowns in the day. Um, he was just doing a fan – they couldn't cover him um, all day. Have him right in front of me here, this touchdown did. It was a fantastic catch. So uh, credit to him. And as you said there, uh, Pitt State was down by 11 early fourth quarter and then um, – was able to get a stop. Washburn all the way down to the Pitt State 5, fumbled. Pitt State drove all the way down the field, down to the Washburn 16. And they kind of let the stall. They didn't really go for a touchdown. They're like, okay, we're in field goal range. We're going to play for the field goal. And this is the same kicker who missed two fourth-quarter field goals versus Northwest in the close loss they had earlier in the year. So I was kind of like, maybe you try to score. I know you don't want to turn the ball over and give yourself no chance, um, but they didn't really go for the end zone at all there late. They kind of were content with just kind of run the clock out as much as they could. And then on the kick, it was a really low uh, trajectory on the kick. And the guy who blocked it was actually in the back row. And apparently he's a former basketball player at Washburn. He just jumped up and high-pointed it pretty much and got a deflection for it. So the heck of a block there by Washburn, and that was all she wrote for it. But it was a fantastic football game, back and forth. You said there, two blocked field goals, five turnovers, including uh, a muffed kickoff return on a sky kick kind of deal. I know Northwest fans uh, hate hearing those words, but it's what it was. Pitt State just – Pooched up in the air, and the Washburn guy couldn't hold on to it. So, fun football game. Washburn escapes with a win and keeps their playoff chances alive, at least. So, the uh, what do you what do you think uh, uh, Washburn chances are to win out? Who do they play this week? I do not remember who they play this week, but I believe they should be favored. I'm trying to remember who they haven't played yet. Um, so far, I know so they've the lost MI, to Emporia. The MIAA columnist does not know who they play this week. A good columnist I'm, starts I his, his schedule memorized. <laughs> Bloody hell. Should, should have it all <laughs> memorized. I know Pitt State has four days. I think Washburn has one of the teams in the conference, though. They have Missouri Southern. So, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they should win that so, game. And uh, they're kind of <laughs> stuck right there with the rest of the kind of GAC schools who have a couple losses. That's going to be interesting how the, uh, the, uh, the committee ranks them this week going to the final week because Washington won't be helped out with uh, shooting the schedule next week. All right. 
Very good. Well, let's look at some other interesting scores from around the country. Uh, in an upset in Texas, West Texas 15, Midwestern State 12. Uh, guys, you know, we haven't talked about this, but uh, there just is not a great team in the Lone Star this year. No, no, there's not. I mean, everybody's beating up on each other here. And right. that game with Midwestern and West Texas, you know, Midwestern was up um, for quite some time in that game. And then WT kind of came through and in the fourth quarter. So that certainly big ups to them. All right. And also in the Lone Star Conference, Angelo State 30, West, or excuse me, Texas A&M Commerce 3. You know, Witt and I were kind of high on the way Commerce was playing lately, but uh, they laid an egg on Saturday. And, you know, Angelo State looks to be in the driver's seat for a playoff spot now. Yeah, I was I was kind of shocked by that, considering how Commerce had been coming on of late. Uh, yeah. Really good defense. You know, the quarterback's back. All these things seem to start – moving the direct in the direction of, okay, they're going to make a run here and find a way to get in the playoffs. Oh yeah. That was just to add that to another one of the picks that we got wrong <laughs> and, and in a big that way. Was, and uh, we, we don't yeah. have a pick segment today on D2. Uh, that was, on, that was never D2. really even a, never really even a close game. So Chris, Thank Chris do you have to go get a graduate degree from uh, Angelo now? <laughs> I, I, I work in classes at Commerce after that. <laughs> hey, Chris, let, Chris, let me ask you. Uh, West Texas, you know, they end up beating Midwestern State and they beat Angelo both. Um, but then they've got, still got four D2 losses, right? Um, mm -hmm. How do you beat the, the, the two top, what is it, two top teams in the in the conference, but you know, you the Permian Basins of the world they, they they struggled with. I mean, I know you've seen more of them than I have. Well, West Texas offense is not very consistent, and that's the issue. They have a pretty good defense that lets them hang in the games. I mean, we saw that particularly with Mines, but they can't seem to convert consistently on offense to 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 vault them, you know, to that next step. So that's really right because they were down twelve fun. nothing in this and on just yesterday. Right. I mean, this you know game, that game yeah. played right. right into WT's hands. Right. Um, with low scoring affair. So it's it's just consistently their their identity, it seems like. Chris, we haven't talked a ton about the Lone Star this year. Um, Angelo State's likely to get a bump here uh, because of the fact that they've got a good strength to schedule. And, uh, you know, win over commerce is, 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 is in the plus column. Um, do you think they're the kind of team that could make a little bit of noise? in super region four that a region that might not have a fire breathing dragon. Yeah. I mean, they, um, the one thing about Angelo is uh, in addition to that really good defense, they played really good ball control. So they can probably keep some of those high powered offenses on the sideline with their run game. So it, it's a, it's a game that if they're able to establish kind of like what they did with, with commerce, uh, it could easily swing their way, even if in even if they are in that five, six, seven slot and have to go on the road. Well, that, that I think they're probably going to be hosting at this rate. They might even be as high as the two or three line tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, and remember, you know, Angelo, I believe, is the one that has the win over um, Central Washington. So, they sure do. Uh, so they do have experience playing some of the top teams in in that region. Yeah, don't be shocked if you see them on the two line, right? Yep. And they've went over Lindenwood, who I don't think is great, but they have a good record as well to help their stream schedule as well out as well. Boy, Lindenwood just took a random shot there. Wow. Um <laughs> <laughs> Lindenwood's only won what like eight, eight in a row now? They're no good. Lindenwood's like what's won like eight here? in a row with a third string quarterback now, <laughs> but they're no good. Lindenwood, no, right, right what did I do? Why's my name in this? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh in in Lindenwood super region. Southeastern Oklahoma beats Wachita Baptist 35-21. Unranked South uh, Eastern Oklahoma. We had Wachita Baptist at six, but uh, uh, clearly they they were rated too high in our poll. And uh, Southeastern, uh, you know, is in a lot better spot for the playoffs. But you know, Wachita seemed like a shoe in with a win over Henderson, and now that's an absolute must win just to have a chance to get in. Yeah, that that was no accident. Uh, Southeastern really took it to them. It was 28 to seven at the half. It was 35 to seven at the end of the third quarter. They were just very physical. They really shut down Wachita's running game. They had a really good handle on the, the direct, the direct snaps. 
You know, Watchdog does a lot of what, what we've kind of called the wildcat offense over the years. They do a lot of that. And Southeastern really did a great job kind of tracking that and shutting it down. And, and uh, Dalton Hatley, their quarterback, is just a, a really good competitor and, and made a lot of plays. So that that was no accident. Okay, you know, guys, the, 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 the GAC, oh, ahead, real quickly, Brandon, they remind yeah. me a little bit of what's going on in the Northern Sun where you've got a collection of teams. I mean, moving past Harding, who's really looks like they're putting their foot on the gas pedal, but you've got Henderson State, you got Wachita Baptist, you got Southeast Oklahoma, you got uh, you know Oklahoma Baptist. You've got a you've got a bunch of squads in that area that I think can all beat up on each other, and you're going to see more than one of them uh, in the dance. It's a matter of just how many are going to make it. They could they could get as many as three. Yeah, for sure. And we were yeah. Super Region three was almost complete chaos because Henderson almost lost to Oklahoma Baptist. They had a game winning field goal there. I know Whit put it on Twitter there, and I was watching that game late. Coming back from Pittsburgh, actually, as well, I was like, we almost had just the max amount of chaos for Super Region Three, which I was kind of rooting for because I wanted to see mass chaos in the Super Region there at the bottom. Uh, so Henderson survives. They still got to play Washington this next week, and that's always a, a toss up game of those two teams being so close to each other. Absolutely. All right. As now let's look. Not, as long as you're not trying to find a way for Northwest and Harding to play, we're all good. <laughs> that that you, you're that's getting it now. You're down to that. Around. You're getting it now, Chris. <laughs> Let's talk about the CIAA. Let's uh, look back first, and, and then uh, let's look forward. Uh, first of all, looking back, uh, St. Augs was winless prior to this week and defeated Shaw 6-3. Uh, special teams and defensive touchdowns, uh, uh, a, a, a good win for a, a program that I don't know if we've ever talked about. Well, the game it was twenty one seventeen. Shaw Shaw was six and three going into this game, and this is oh okay six and game. three before Saturday. I got you. Okay, yeah. So like uh, for those who don't know, these two schools are are based are both based in Raleigh. Um, right. They're private schools. They're they're big rivals, and um, and Saint Aug, you know, was a, a program that had been really struggling um, with some uh, turnovers in, in football. They had an athletic director who has been a long time. Um, the guy there for track who ended up leaving. Uh, and so you have uh, uh, David Bowser who came in uh, as the athletic director and the head coach um, for football and didn't play his first game. He was one of those coaches that got hired and didn't have his first game until after COVID happened. Right. right. Um, and so, you know, St. Ong <laughs> has like more than 50 freshmen on their team. And, you know, they become the kind of the punchline uh, so much that, you know, I was just like, I, I don't see a win here. So, you know, why bother? And uh, right. and that's why they play the game. Right. And so, right. you know, they, they made sure to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> How they feel. It's like, OK, at least you're reading. I know you're paying attention now. So that's good. Um, that's what you want right there. Win. It clicks. Incred incredible win for, for David Bowser and his bunch. So, you know, definitely <laughs> want to give him some love. Okay, Chris, did, and, uh, did they buzz, did they buzz your tower on Twitter at all or not? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, they let me know. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, one other thing, uh, you're talking about rivalries. Uh, Livingstone, Johnson C. Smith called in the third quarter. A uh, little brawl there. So uh, that's a disappointing way for both those teams <laughs> to end their season, not getting to complete a, a game. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, two teams in the CIAA do get to keep playing, and uh, there are three official championship games this weekend, PSAC, SIAC, uh, and the CIAA. And in the CIAA, uh, Bowie State will be playing Fayetteville State. I'll just say it, maybe, maybe this is my favorite FSU in the country, Devin. Uh, they're going to play for the CIAA crown. So uh, joining us now uh, to talk about that game and about the CIAA is uh, Bowie State uh, head coach Damon Wilson. Coach, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Hey, it's great to have you here. So uh, yesterday, let's talk about, look back a little bit. Uh, you went against Elizabeth City State. Uh, you started Larry Williams at quarterback, played a lot of, of, of uh, you know, uh, backup type players. Uh, was that the game plan going into the game? It was. It was. We had already clinched the division, and uh, we wanted to get those guys an opportunity to play as well as get healthy for the championship game. Uh, we, you know, we have a number of guys that's been practicing all, all year long, but didn't have an opportunity to get a lot of plays. So we got had that opportunity yesterday and took advantage of it. And now we're able to look at those guys on film and build off something that they were able to do yesterday. So, Coach, um, one of the things that I think is really special 
um, is, is that you and a number of your staff are actually Bowie State graduates. And a lot of people don't really know about Bowie State. So can you talk to, talk to us a little bit about what, what, what is so special about Bowie State? Well, Bowie State University is located in Maryland in the uh, suburbs of Prince George's County. Uh, we, our enrollment is uh, 6,200 students right now. Uh, we're maybe 15 minutes from Washington, D.C., 15 minutes from Baltimore. Uh, I, we, we used to be a teacher's college. You know, a lot of people used to go uh, to receive their degrees so they could become right. teachers. And uh, now, you know, we, we're putting a lot of resources into our entrepreneurship and our computer science, computer tech. You know, our administration does a good job making sure the students are getting, you know, are well-rounded and educated in the fields that they can uh, be successful in and, and make a living off of. Yeah, and and one of the other things that I think is just really special is, you know, we talk a lot about offense. I mean, that's the flashy part, but the defense <laughs> for Bowie State is 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 incredible. And I got some numbers for you. So, okay. uh, Bowie State is third in the country in total defense. Fable State's number two, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> uh, number one in defensive touchdowns. Uh, we were talking earlier even about you know, New Haven, you know, getting really close to winning their conference and, and Bowie State's their only loss this year. You know, number eight in red zone defense, number eight in scoring defense. This is in the country. I mean, you, you got these guys like Demetri Morsell, who is the reigning uh, CIW player of the year on defense, Joshua Pryor, uh, Jonathan Ross. You know, what do those guys mean to this program and what they bought into uh, at Bowie State? I mean, they mean a lot. And the coach Sewell and, and the rest of the defensive coaches do a great job preparing those guys. But those guys you just mentioned, those guys came in our program as freshmen. You know, we redshirted all those guys, as you just mentioned. And now these guys are, are, are redshirt juniors or redshirt sophomores on the football field with a total understanding of our defense. And, and, and you know, we welcome in some transfers. And those guys brought right into the program, brought right into the defense. And, and we've been talking all year about being selfless versus selfish. And I think that's something that the guys are really hanging their hat on and it's really paying dividends for us on the field. So, uh, you know, you have to do some, or you, at least you have done some creative scheduling at, uh, at Bowie, you know, you played Delaware state, uh, you know, but then you've also played Saginaw Valley, New Haven, you were going to play at Texas A&M commerce. Yeah. Uh, what is the strategy uh, behind that scheduling? Well, my goal is to to win a national championship, and in, and in order to get there, you must play those teams. I want to see where we are as a program. You know, we're not a program that have has all of the financial support that we need. However, you know, we're going to try to make up the difference in hard work and preparation. And uh, so those those are things that we, you know, it's important to schedule. You know, you just don't want to beat up on the teams in your conference. You want to represent the conference well in those non-conference games. And as you mentioned, you know, Delaware State is a one double A program. Right. I think they're right around the 500 mark in the MIAC. Uh, but then you play Saginaw Valley and New Haven, two very good Division II programs that's been around for a long time. And for us to have an opportunity to play those uh, programs and win, I mean, I think it speaks volumes about our program and, and our conference. Right. And, and, and again, I wasn't discounting, you know, Delaware State. I was talking about the proximity. You know, they're not that far away. Right. But, you know, when you're going to go to Texas, you're going to go to, you know, Michigan or wherever to play. You know, those are, those are big, expensive trips. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, though. You know, as far as playing those games, that's something we want to do. Uh, yeah. But unfortunately, it's, it's get, it gets tougher and tougher to schedule or find those non-conference games within our region. You know, I would love right. to play. You know, it's one of the, another FCS school up the street, Morgan State, Howard University. You know, I would love to play those schools uh, from, a, from a proximity standpoint. Uh, but, you know, we haven't had the opportunity to do that in years. So we got to kind of find, fill our schedule how we can. You, you mentioned transfers and you got one guy on there who um, it has been do, doing has been really hot lately, uh, which is Khalil Wilkins. And, you know, it, it was like Bowie State kind of struggled a little bit in the run game early on, but has sort of sort of caught fire, um, you know, lately. So talk a little bit about that, too. Khalil, Khalil Wilkins is a guy we recruited out of high school, ended up picking another university, and uh, after his second year there, decided to transfer back home. Uh, he's, he's a workhorse, you know, and, and our second game of the season against Saginaw, we lost three starting O linemen. We lost both tackles and we lost the uh, our starting center for the year. So, we you know, we had to kind of plug and play early. Uh, so, therefore, it caused us some 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 uh, some issues running the ball early on. But now these guys are kind of battle-tested now. 
we have five to six guys that we play every every week, and they're getting better each week. We're still not all the way there, but uh, they're giving us an opportunity to kind of be a, more of a balanced offense and, and, and lean on Khalil to, to carry this offense in our run game. So we're approaching, you know, a, a pretty big milestone. Um, so Bowie State plays in the CIAA championship game uh, this weekend. There's only a, a couple of teams that have won uh, three straight titles. Um, so it's a pretty big affair. Um, and you're you're doing it now playing against a team that has seen you play um, twice already, Fayetteville State. So, you know, three three games in a row, three championship games in a row against the same team. How do you keep these guys uh, motivated and hungry when they play and seen the same team in the championship game, you know, now three times in a row? I, I think you just said it. I, we're not seeing the same team. We're seeing the same university. This is a different team in 2019 and 2018. Same thing I told my guys. We're not trying to play for a three-peat. You guys haven't won anything at Bowie State University with regards to a championship. This is the first year that this team has played, the first year this team has been together, and that's been our thought process the whole time. So our university has a chance to win its third consecutive championship fit against you know the same opponent, but this team is entirely different. We have – we had 24 seniors off that 2019 team. We have 21 seniors this year. Uh, so they, they, these, and we only have 15 guys on our team that played in 2019. So, you know, this is a different ball club. And uh, I think it really it really shows what the coaching staff was able to do during the pandemic and keeping the guys focused and, and get those guys ready to play the season. All right, Coach. Well, Best of luck against Fayetteville State. Best of luck in the playoffs. I, I cannot tell you how pleased I am to, to hear that national championships are your goal. We need, you know, more programs that are very serious about that. And uh, I'm incredibly happy to hear that. So uh, best of luck again. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate hey, I appreciate you guys for having me. Thanks for everything you do for D2 football. You got it. Thanks, Coach. See you on Saturday. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, Damon Wilson, the head coach at uh, Bowie State. Uh, so, men, it is time to look – slave, huh? <laughs> Stay frosty. I got you. The, uh, it, let's go ahead and, and uh, look ahead then at the regional rankings, guys. Uh, you know, we mentioned our good friend Inkblot, and he's done a pretty good job of uh, uh, projecting the regional rankings. And this week he projects that they will look like this uh, – Kutztown, Shepherd, New Haven, Notre Dame, Bentley, Slippery Rock, California, Shippensburg, Charleston, and Tiffin in Super Region 1. That's important to note, guys, that Tiffin's on the 10 line right now. All right? Rem remind, remember that when we go and talk about this. Valdosta State, Bowie State, uh, Albany State, West Florida, Newberry, West Georgia, Lenore, Ryan, Mars Hill, Savannah State, and Fayetteville State. Uh, Ferris State, that's Super Region 2. Ferris State leads Super Region 3. Harding Grand Valley, Northwest Missouri. Lindenwood Henderson. Uh, Nebraska Kearney. Southeastern Oklahoma. Washburn. And Washita Baptist. And then in Super Region 4, Colorado Mines. Uh, Angelo State. Western Colorado. Central Washington. Augustana. Bemidji State. Minnesota Duluth. Midwestern State. And, and Colorado Mesa and Sioux Falls. Uh, we'll pull these down. We'll pull this down, guys. We'll get your initial thoughts, and then we'll pull them back up if we need to speak specifically about any region. What were? Uh, did anybody have any initial thoughts? Boy, Tiffin's getting really close to triggering the own access rule. Um, but that's that's why I mentioned that. Yeah. 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 The, so you know, Super Region One is has been kind of notorious for that in history, and um, we're kind of seeing that again. Um, where so it, as a refresher, the mm -hmm. earn access rule is if you don't have a team in your conference that's in the top seven, you, if you have a team in the top in eight or nine, they will bump the seven team out of the playoffs. So you know, it's a pretty big game for uh, Tiffin this upcoming right. weekend. Uh, are, are we clear that it's still nine? It yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, it's eight or nine. It used to be eight, but now it's now okay. it's nine. I knew it was expanded. I just couldn't remember how, how yeah. far it was expanded. So uh, is so anybody – Tiffin and ahead, Finley – who you don't see in here is Finley, who would be on the outside. Tiffin and Finley play this weekend 
And, Mm -hmm. you know, Finley's already a three loss team. So if Finley wins that game and then the best team in the GMAC is a three loss team, that that probably knocks them out of the playoffs. Depending on Finley's strength of schedule. Um, I mean, because they're going to have Lindenwood on there and some others that are going to really help their SOS. I mean, they, who knows, Chuck, they could, they could parachute in, but you have a very, you bring up a very important point there. Yeah. And there's, there's still a chance that the GMAC gets left out. Yep. Right. In super region two, are there any surprises uh, in anybody's minds? Not surprises, but there's a lot to still sort out with Chuck. Sure. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think you, uh, Inkblot is projecting a few shifts here because of Newberry getting a good win over Wingate and a little bit of OWP bump, which is already fairly decent for them. Um, there, there's still a bit of a mess there, even if you just look at 5, 7, and 8. Uh, you don't have clear head-to-head winners there because Lenore Ryan beat Mars Hill, Mars Hill beat Newberry, Newberry beat Lenore right. Ryan. So he's kind of looking at it as I'm just looking at all of them as two lost teams now and, and look at the best SOS. So that's probably where it goes right now. Um, I don't know that that would be kind of a big move to kind of put Mars Hill down below the other two sack teams right now. They're ahead. We'll see how bold this committee wants to be. The other thing I think that points out super region two is Savannah state because right now their season is complete. So, Oh, okay. You know, there was yeah. some chatter about, you know, does Savannah State try to play an 11th game to try to strengthen their their schedule? And there's certainly some CIAA teams that probably would accommodate that, you know, and they play it on a, on a Thursday or Friday night. Um, so, you know, th- that's something else that, you know, if they're kind of serious about making a push, that's something to consider. Chris, you and I may or may not have been involved in instigating that chatter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Chris, then they got to find a, a team who would help them from an SOS standpoint. Yeah, and right. the CIW has it. Um, I think the CIW, like Chowan is a really good candidate, especially because they beat Mars Hill, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so that would have been one for sure. And and uh, so, yeah, and they're seven and three. So, I mean, that's right. a pretty good matchup. Um, mm-hmm. And then Fable State, because if Fable State beats – Bowie State, then you know, does that is that enough to leapfrog them into like maybe seven? You right. Know? Yeah. That's going to yeah. be a big win from an SOS standpoint. Right. Yep. Huge. You know, it's it, it's a good recovery in my opinion by Lenore Ryan to be where they are, considering how they were scuffling at one point. Uh, yeah. They they've really turned it around there. Uh, let's look at Super Region Three. Um, my expectation was that it would be a little bit different. But in your conversations, does anybody have anything different or does Super Region 3 seem accurate to everybody else? It looks pretty accurate to me. Uh, I think it's interesting to get Carney. There is the highest rated two loss team over Southeast Oklahoma at this point. I think uh, both are hoping that Wachita beats Henderson, that we could possibly jump up a little bit. I think if Henderson loses, Southeast probably jumps in as that second GAC team in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the top five are pretty much set. And we'll be in the playoffs either way. Even if Linda Wood, I'm not sure who they play this week. If they lose, they'll still be a top nine team. So they'll get in versus you know, earn access anyways. Okay. Um, so yeah, everything looks pretty pretty good to me. Uh, Washburn, they need a prayer at this point. A couple, they need a couple of losses right. ahead of them. Um, and so does Watchtop Baptist at this point, I think. So um, a lot of work still to be done. But a lot of these teams only have themselves to blame for where they're at at this point. So like Washburn, Wash- they should. Losing Washburn to Emporia could- State's got to kill them right now. It's got to well, sting. Cause well, Washburn could bad. get in. If somehow they were Northwest Missouri loses and they were both eight and two, uh, that would yeah. get Washburn in ahead of Northwest Missouri. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the only for, thing is Northwest Missouri is going to have a higher SOS by a good margin because they didn't have to play Lincoln. Gotcha. So it might keep them apart. They may not yeah. be viewed as nearly identical to which the head to head would come into play, gotcha. but it is okay. a valid point, Brandon, for sure. Okay. Okay. Now, now Brandon, uh, you know, you asked in regards to the super region, I would not be shocked if two, three, and four ended up being different tomorrow. I think there is such a small difference in the numbers between mm-hmm. Harding, Grand Valley, and Northwest. Grand Valley strength of schedule is sky high. Um, you know, they're they're kind of hampered a bit by not playing as many games. And at some point, I personally think Grand Valley 
is going to end up on the two line. I think Northwest may end up on the three line. And Harding, because their strength of schedule really fades at the end here, gotcha. may end up on the four line. Now, at the end of the day, two, three, and four are all hosting football games. Mm -hmm. So it's not a massive thing. But it would just matter if uh, if those top four teams, you know, let's say they win out, for example, then you're looking at four going to one and two to three, and that's really when it matters. But I I don't know if we're gonna I don't know if we're really locked into Harding Grand Valley Northwest. Gotcha. Um, and and I think that's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I want to mention one thing. I know Inkblot just said in the comments, if Northwest was to lose, it'd be Northwest, Carney, Washburn, all with two losses, all with loss wins against each other too. So yeah, you'd okay. have a three-way. He wanted to make sure we mentioned that as well. That'd be three things there as well. So I'm curious gotcha. to see if Northwest can jump to that top three over Grand Valley as well. Uh, there's a lot of things that'll be very interesting with the committee tomorrow. How they do the Super Region when there's multiple teams who don't play anybody out of conference. You don't know how good the MIAA and GAC are this year because you don't play in a conference games as well. Right. All right. Well, the other thing to look at is Northwest does not have, in, in the viewpoint of this criteria, does not have as many quality wins as Harding and Grand Valley. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they fall short in that category. Um, so Northwest is a little bit one of those let's wait and see. But mm -hmm. I just keep thinking Grand Valley is going to end up on that two line here, and I could be totally wrong. That is true, Matt, but uh, you could be right because remember we discussed it, and Northwest Missouri would have Emporia – and Missouri Western become quality wins this week mm -hmm. because like Emporia is six and four, which that mm -hmm. will be a, a quality win for Northwest Missouri Western with their win uh, over central Oklahoma is now five Missouri. and five, but they're, but they're, but they're five and four for Northwest and they have Lincoln. So they're likely going to finish, uh, with a, you know, as far as Northwest is concerned, a mm -hmm. six and four record. So that'll be interesting. We, we might know a lot tomorrow uh, when they're out officially. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's look at Super Region 4. Angelo State comes barreling back into consideration after being kind of <laughs> left for dead early uh, early in the year. Western Colorado, in my mind, the surprise, uh, I can't think of a bigger surprise in all of this than uh, yeah. seeing Western Colorado there. It's incredible, this, you know, their yeah. story this year. Yeah, this this is a little bit of a wild one, and Augustana certainly you know takes a drop with their their loss to to uh, to Duluth. And mm -hmm. in taking a look at this here, you know I've been chatting a little bit with Inkblot about Western Colorado. I didn't quite have him as high as three. I know he does uh, per the numbers. the The challenge for Western Colorado and Central Washington both is, is frankly quality wins. Um, they're they're just lacking compared to. Augustana, Bemidji, and Duluth who follow, who all have quite a few quality wins. So it's a matter of if how much that criteria really gets applied. Um, because if they go strictly by strength of schedule and winning percentage, I could see a scenario in which you see the one, two, three, four, the way you do right there, um, which would make for a bit of a, you know, a challenge to not have too many flights. But I think that we're already kind of at the point where we think that's a problem anyway in the super region, <laughs> right? Um, Midwestern state with their loss, uh, probably drops them to the seven or eight spot, um, and, and puts them on a real brink of not making the playoffs at this point. And then at the same time, you have Mesa at nine, who's kind of just stuck there because their strength of schedule isn't going to help them out enough to get a bump. And you have University of Sioux Falls, who gets rewarded for wins over Mankato and Wayne in the last two weeks, but is likely going to peak right around that 10 spot because of the fact that they have Upper Iowa this next week, which will really drastically pull down their strength of schedule. So, you know, if, you, if you're sitting on in any of these super regions, if you're at eight, nine or 10, you have to hope for a collapse at four, five, six, and seven, or, and, and you're really playing, you know, you're kind of going on hope that somehow one of those, some of those teams lose so that all you do is you take care of your business and then find out that everybody in front of you lost. And Hey, all of a sudden you're in the dance. Yep, right. Chaos. Mm -hmm. And also Inkblot did put in the comments, if you beat a five and five team, it does not count. That is right. very Western. They'll get to six and five this week. They're playing Lincoln. They should win that game by minimum 50. Right. So, but according to to Whit, minimum he, fifty, he goes. <laughs> Lincoln's bad. They're the worst defense in Division Two. A lot of shots but, fired tonight. According to Wit, though, the record against the opponent does not count. So when uh, somebody, you know, if A beats B, 
the loss doesn't count for B, even including this. But we could we could be incorrect on that. Ink bot thinks otherwise. So I don't know. They're two smart okay. guys. I'm not getting between the two of them. So sure, fair enough. So well, th- so, thank uh, you, Devin, for that compliment. <laughs> so 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 lit. You that the five, six, seven are are NSIC teams. Did they like beat up on each other? Uh, yes, they've all beaten each other actually. Okay. Um, so you you run into that situation as well where. Um, you can't do a whole lot with that because the beauty contest becomes more layers deep at that point. You're exactly right. All right. Let's go ahead and look at what the playoffs would look like if they were to start uh, oh. next weekend. And I think it's a little more fun than last week. Uh, Super Region 1, uh, Kutztown would get the bye. Uh, Shepard would host Bentley. New Haven would host California. Notre Dame would host Slippery Rock. Super Region 2 would feature Valdosta State getting the bye. Bowie State would host Lenore Ryan. Uh, Albany State would host New Newberry. West Florida would host West Georgia. Super Region 3 would see Ferris State with the bye. Harding hosting Henderson State. Uh, Grand Valley hosting Lindenwood. And Northwest Missouri hosting Minnesota Duluth, who would be a transfer over from Super Region 4. Uh, in Super Region 4, Colorado Mines would get the bye. Angelo State would host Augustana. Western Colorado would host Nebraska Kearney, oh. who would be a transfer from Super Region 3. And Su- uh, Central Washington would host Bemidji State. So uh, it, very interesting, more interesting in my opinion. I know some people do not like the transfer of Super Regions. I find it extremely interesting. Yeah, this will be fun. This looks better than last week's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the interesting thing is that you have Super Region 3 and 4 essentially trading Duluth from one to for Kearney for the other because of the fact that Kearney can seemingly travel via bus to the Colorado squads, whereas Duluth cannot. But Duluth can travel on bus to Northwest Missouri State. <laughs> and, you know, it, we, Inkblot and I chatted today, but last night when I was kind of drawing up my own version of this, I also had Duluth going to Northwest Missouri State. It just seems like something that's likely, uh, given where all the other teams are located. Um, of course, I'm not a huge fan of seeing Harding and Henderson playing. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of those kind of right. matchups, but it, it's inescapable, I think, given the mm-hmm. given the situation in the middle of the country. Um, but I, I, I really think an interesting matchup is if Augustana does not get themselves as high as the four line, which I think they might still yet, but we'll have to wait and see because they have a lot of quality wins. Uh, but Augustana at Angelo, I'm not sure though. That's not two of the better teams in that super region meeting round one. Um, and, uh, you know, Colorado mines looked really good yesterday. Don't get me wrong, but that would be, I think the marquee matchup in that super region. Um, what mm-hmm. other what other what other matchups, guys? Because we're only a week away, so some of this could very well stick. What other matchups intrigue you guys? Duluth Northwest is awesome in the first round. That's all I got. Yeah, you, you realize Duluth Duluth is still bringing in their third string quarterback. I just for like history for me personally, Northwest fans see a team you haven't seen the playoffs, but you have in the past kind of deal. I think just a interesting kind of a fun old school matchup there with Duluth and Duluth. I know. They're their backup quarterback, third string quarterback. I mean, they just whooped up on Augie, so they're still not a pushover by any means. Right. And, I know. just don't know if you can count on turning somebody over six times. You know how that works. But that's fair. Um, well, let's uh, turn a little bit this year, though. So if, 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 if full disclosure, if Duluth had John Larson, who's probably the best quarterback in the Northern Sun when healthy, that would be a really interesting matchup at Northwest. I just think that Northwest would really. Uh, uh, be a tough go for them with how well Northwest defends against the third string quarterback. But you sure. know what? Let, let, let's see it happen first. Um, mm-hmm. How about, how about uh, in the other regions? What do you guys think? I really want to see, I really want to see Albany state in, in the playoffs. I think that that is a team that, you know, we, we don't know how good they are yet, but their defense is legit. They are really, really good. I, I'm, I'm excited about the prospect of them. They've still got to get through miles in the SIAC championship game, which I think they will. Uh, I'm excited to see them. I would actually really like to see them play one of the Golf South teams. And so, what I was thinking the same thing, Chuck. I'm not a big fan of seeing the Golf South left side of the bracket there type of thing. I would love oh, to yeah. see. I, yeah. I would really like to see that 
I, I would love to see Albany play one, and I'd like to see Bowie play the other. I know Chris doesn't want to hear that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I like that. Yeah. Well, I really I, like, I like the, this. I like this matchup. I like this matchup. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Lenore Ryan Bowie game. Would be that would be a, a, a fun game. I like that, but I would, yeah, I, I agree. It would be more fun to maybe see Newberry take one of the Gulf South teams and and see uh, Albany State against the other. Well, let, let's let's take a two second snapshot, guys. I mean, let's think about this. If Valdosta beats West Florida, for example, which I mean, Valdosta is going to be a slight favorite in that game. Mm-hmm. West Florida is probably not staying on that four line. That's true too. So then, all of a sudden, West Florida and West Georgia theoretically could, would have to travel. So you're breaking up that GSC thing right there, and maybe all of a sudden you see one go to Albany, the other one go to Bowie. Chris yes, is right. Chris right point. now is 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 taking down the map behind us. He doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I Are think they- I think Bemidji in the playoffs is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm. This is speaking as somebody who's done this, and you know, Chuck's done this forever, and and so have I. But seeing Bemidji in there would be interesting. Western State or Western Colorado. That's how old I am. Yeah, uh, Whit and I talked it, on uh, Saturday morning. Right. Whit, you you confirmed Bit, Bemidji's never been in the playoffs, right? Right, right. So this the, this a lot of match. Anytime you get some new stuff like that, and frankly, new matchups. Period. I mean, sure. for for guys like us, that's why we don't want to see the Harding, you know, Correct. Northwest game again and stuff like that. I don't even want to see Duluth Northwest because they've played numerous times in in well one championship game and in the playoffs several times. I would love to see. You know, somebody completely new. Uh, you know, Duluth that versus. Hasn't happened since I was in high school, Brandon. What's that? It's been years since Duluth and Northwest played in the playoffs. Since I was in high school. Well, well that, that, that was two that years o- ago. That only speaks to your <laughs> inexperience. It does not speak to our age. It was so, like two um, years in a row, Brandon, or whatever. So I agree with you. Yes. Yes, it's just it, it's not it's not that fun. I would much rather see, um, you know, Central. Wa- it won't happen, but Central Washington gets shipped out to. Uh, Fair State or something; those things to me are interesting. Uh, n- new matchup. I I just like uh, something that I haven't seen before. Brandon, uh, I'm thrilled that we're not seeing Pueblo at Mankato for the 14th straight year. So yeah, I know uh, what you mean. A hundred percent. I mean, it, you know, it's just it's very hard to get excited about it. And I know that it's a product of the of the attempt to save money that it's going to happen more than I would like. Yeah. But if we can make it chaotic and save money, I would be all for that because. That, that's much more interesting, you know, throwing, uh, let's say you throw a, a Harding or a Washita in, in Super Region 2 or, or you know, uh, any anywhere, a Man- Mankato in Super Region 3 or something like that. Anything interesting, uh, anything new is 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 great, in, in my opinion. So, the yeah, the, yeah. the um, Notre Dame Slippery Rock game yeah. has a potential to be, I think, a high-scoring game. I agree. That one was interesting to me as well. So, I, I thought that one was uh, that one was going to be interesting. Of course, uh, you know, we've, we've got to get there first. So uh, that's what we think they'll look like tomorrow. Uh, of course, you know, check uh, check our site. Follow us on Twitter. We'll tweet that out as, as soon as we know. Uh, we'll have it on site as soon as we know. Um, it's that time of year. One week left in the regular season. Uh, let's switch our focus to talking about uh, Harlan Hill candidates. Uh, so, uh in my opinion, uh, Chuck, I've got to think Tyson Bajan is the front runner at this point. Do you disagree with that? No, I, I think he's actually the very clear favorite. Um, okay. And we've got a lot of players we want to talk about, so we'll, we'll kind of go around and, and just mention a few. We've got a lot we want to talk about, but I, I think it will be very unlikely if it's not a quarterback this year. Um just because there doesn't seem to really be a, a running back or receiver that's really put up the numbers and has kind of the name recognition. So I think it'll be a running back. Uh, I think it'll be a quarterback. Um, Bajan, he's first in the nation in yards per game, first in touchdowns. He's number three in passing efficiency. Um, you know, well over 3,000 yards already, 346 yards per game, 42 touchdowns, seven interceptions, a phenomenal ratio, a 185 QBR. The only thing you might nitpick a little bit if you want to compare him to some of the others, um, his yards per completion isn't quite as good as some others, 13.29 per completion. That's about f- almost 50th in the country. So one nitpick there, but uh, his numbers are phenomenal. Shepard is a really good football team. He has not had a bad game. 
He's not had one bad game this year. Um, so when you stack all that up, uh, I, I think he's the very clear front runner. Um, all right. Well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, so, you know, Bajan is my QB one for fantasy football. And there, there was one game that wasn't exactly the greatest, which was the Millersville game. It was rather pedestrian at best. Um, but nonetheless, Yes, he's had an excellent year, and I think he is a front runner. I just want to throw that out there. Well, I, I would like to know from the only person in this group who won a playoff game this past week, why <laughs> Austin Reed should win the Harlan Hill instead of Tyson Bajan. Well, Austin Reed's 181 of 306 for six, just about 60%, just shy of it, a 59% completion percentage, thrown for 2,900 yards. 330 per game, 33 touchdown, five interceptions. He's fifth in the country in uh, yards per completion. It's just a little over 16. It's like 16.1. And he's seventh in passing efficiency. So he, he is making a statement and arguably probably the toughest conference and one of if not the toughest conferences in, in Division II football. And and I think, you know, we, we talk about this, you know, the Harlan Hill uh, winner, you know, winning big games and he has that opportunity this week when Valdosta and, and West Florida get together down in uh, Pensacola. So th this could be a big statement game for, for Austin in stating his case, why he should be the, uh, the Harlan Hill. So is, is there a difference guys in the, what is your opinion? Uh, the Harlan Hill is, is kind of the, the player of the year rather than the MVP. And if we had an MVP, would it be Austin Reed? Does anybody have an opinion? That that's, the that, that's, that's, a, that's a very good I, point. I think he would clearly be the front runner when you consider, I don't want to say value, but when you look at how good their team is. Okay. Um, I mean, he's, and, and frankly, he's dealt with the pressure of the national championship yeah. that they won mm -hmm. and hasn't missed a beat. Um, I mean, it, they have been real, real good this year. Um, and, and so is he. And uh, so when you when you consider that, I, I think you've got a good point, Brandon. But I mean, let's not discount the fact that Shepard is, you know, sure, pretty yeah. high high up there themselves. Right. right. Um, certainly, we may end up talking about some other guys yeah. tonight that aren't on a team that's going to even be in the regional rankings or play in, in the playoffs. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that does bring up an important question: that is this just a stat grab? Um, or is there some aspect to this, maybe 25, 20% of this, where you look and say, yeah, they have to have the stats, but also they need to be on a team that's kind of a, a playoff type squad um, and, and kind of put those two together. What, what do you guys think? Well, it's always think... been an issue for, for, for us, you know, in the CRAA SIC land, because you have these players that can really do well, even out of conference, but they don't really get um, the, that national uh, look and they kind of get really passed over. So I think it kind of hurts, you know, some of the lesser known conferences well, um, in, in that respect. Let well, me I mean, Hall made push... the playoffs a few years ago, though, right? Yeah, Amir Hall did. Yeah, he made yeah. the finals, right? The final, was he a finalist? Yeah, but yeah, he's not let, let, let me push back on that, but back you up. Because the Harlan Hill Trophy is an offensive award. And if you look in, in like the NFL rosters, a lot of the great players that come from, that are on defense that come from Division II are CIAA and SIAC players too. I mean, that that's just, that's the nature of it. So because of the nature of the award, I, award, I think you're right. But it's it's because... You know, we're not honoring defensive players like we should. Only Ronald McKinnon's won a Harlan Hill as a defensive player. Right, right. So, but you know what? Let's we're gonna circle back to that, Chris, because I want to talk about that because there's a guy in the CIAA I'd like to talk about. Um, but let's go ahead, Matt. You had mentioned that there were people that were not necessarily on playoff teams or even good teams. One of uh, there's a receiver in your conference that's having a heck of a year. Yeah, it's an interesting story. Uh, Danny Kittner uh, from the University of Mary up in Bismarck, North Dakota, 
uh, you know, an, an under 500 squad, but his numbers almost kind of lap the field. I mean, he's got 109 catches, which is 25 plus more than anyone else at, at the level, uh, over 1400 yards receiving 14 scores. Uh, I mean, he, he's just, he has been outstanding. And, you know, uh, in talking with, you know, like Josh Buchanan, our, our, our D2 scout, he's been saying that he's getting some looks as well. Uh, great possession receiver that can do a little everything, exceptional route guy. Uh, you also got, you know, for if you want to look a little further in, I mean, in terms of prospects, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Elliot Curry at, at Henderson State, he's he is a tremendous player. Uh, got over 1,200 yards receiving, 83 uh, 83 receptions, and and 14 scores himself. But you have to wonder: is there a chance that a Danny Kittner, whose numbers just jump off the page, does he end up, you know, getting a chance to maybe uh, advance or 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 kind of go a little further in this, just because his numbers are so much better? Uh, than those that he's competing with at that position. I, I mean, I, I, it kind of brings up that question. You know, one thing I find interesting also, and I, I don't know the answer to your question, Matt, but we're not even talking about Henry Litwin either, and he's a great player. There's those are three great receivers. Uh, well, and that brings up an interesting two. that brings up an interesting thing, Brandon, because you know Litwin is actually not even the leading receiver on his team. Is that the same? Uh, thing? In, in terms of total receptions Who's and that? you know, Co coach Lutz talk. Uh, I, I, I think it? it's, um, it's, it's not is, is win. I think it's win. win. Okay. I think it's win. Okay. So, you know, and coach Lutz talked about all of them. And, and one of the things that we've talked about before, and it's worth remembering is that each team can only nominate one player. Right. Yes. So, you know, I, now if I'm slippery rock, I'm going to nominate Litwin because he's got some name recognition. He has the best chance to go further. But I don't know what they'll ultimately decide to do. But that's worth remembering that each team can only nominate one player. Yeah, and that, that's a very good point, Chuck, because, you know, if you've got two superstars, for example, let's say quarterback and receiver, because if your receiver's going to have big numbers, it's probably because your quarterback's going to have big numbers too, everything else. You have to kind of make a decision as to, you know, the quarterback position's much harder to stand out at. Whereas maybe some of these other spots aren't quite as hard and you can kind of move yourself up uh, as a result of that. Right. All right. Devin, uh, you're, you are pleased. I know that Al McKellar entered your league that you get to cover. He's a great person to cover, but mm -hmm. in my opinion, his former teammate, Toriano Clinton uh, might have an outside shot. Uh, especially if, if Indianapolis had kept had had won like they were expected to, but uh, Clinton might have an outside shot at it. Yeah, he's got 1,500 yards this year, averaging about seven and a half yards a carry, 17 touchdowns. He's missed the last two games. Too. He got hurt two games ago. Only had four carries for four yards, so he would have even bigger numbers at this point. Um, they are six and four, which will probably ding him a little bit, maybe in some people's eyes. Uh, their four losses are really close. I think it's three three. Eight, another close loss there to S and T. So, I mean, they have. I mean, they're a good team. I know I was looking uh, with the Ramos, the GLVC columnist, and he kind of a performance indicator for the region kind of deal. And UND yeah. ranks really high in there. It just couldn't close out games kind of deal early in the season. Kind of put them behind the eight ball. They might actually be the best team in that conference if it's played out over a hundred games kind of deal. But this small sample size, they had some tough losses. So, I mean, he's a really good player. Um, the, there's. There's going to be some limitations, though, there with their team just not being as good. And him, the injury is probably going to hurt him as well uh, going forward. He won't be able to put any more numbers, most likely. But Al McKellar, he's 1,100 yards right now, 12 touchdowns. I think he has seven touchdowns in the last two weeks. So he's heating up at the right time for Northwest, um, averaging over six yards of care. And he's really the engine that makes that Northwest offense run. Sometimes they can get a little iffy in the passing game, but he's always there to truck stick one or two defenders a play kind of deal and gain that extra couple yards. So uh, he's a real fun player to watch. And, um, Probably the second best player on the United Belay, in my opinion, at this point. Kind of deal him and TJ Davis for Carney, who we'll get to in a little bit, I guess. Um, but he's definitely going to be in the running for him. And he has name recognition as well, being a two-time finalist or nominee for it as well. So he'll have that going for him on a really good team. Chuck, there's also a good running back in your conference. And I think we should mention it. I don't think he has a chance to win the uh, the Harlan Hill because he's a freshman. But Dwayne McGee's had a great year for Lenore Ryan. 
Uh, two, two running backs I'll mention that are, are freshmen okay. in, in the sack who've had outstanding seasons. It's a year out for them. You know, if they have these kind of years next year, we're we're going to be talking about them as finalists. Yeah, Dwayne McGee at Lenore Ryan's had, a, had an, an awesome year. And Jordan Terrell has just been, from start to finish at Barton, has just been a what was such a player to watch. His numbers have been pretty good throughout the whole year. Playing on a first-year program, uh, to, to have somebody who legitimately could could be mentioned in the Harlan Hill, that in itself is is pretty awesome. So it's a year out for them. But, you know, a lot of guys who have won this award had a really big year the year before. Right. So there, there are two guys that we can already put on to the, the early season watch list uh, next season. So, Chris, let's uh, swing it back to defense because uh, we, we had just talked about that. Uh, you know, we, you talked about all the great players on, on Bowie State's defense. Uh, but the player that would, in my opinion, have the greatest chance to win the Harlan Hill on defense this year might be from your league and uh, Keyshawn James at Fayetteville State. He's been player player of the week twice this year. Yeah, so Keyshawn James is one of those guys that's been um, consistently um, high output uh, on Fayetteville State's yeah, defense. Yeah. So remember, Fayetteville State has um, you know total defense number three. No, I'm sorry, number two in the country. Right. Um, and Keyshawn James, his stats in nine games, uh, 62 tackles, um, 10 tackles, 10 and a half tackles for loss. Uh, I'm sorry, 21 tackles for right. loss, two and a half sacks. Right. Um, he, he's also had, you know, four forced fumbles and, and a fumble recovery. I mean, the guy, he had a game recently where he literally pulled a, a Jadavian Clowney with the Michigan um, that famous clip where he just, you know, lunch into <laughs> launch into the into the backfield and almost the running back. He had one of those moments this year. I mean, the guy's incredible, and um, you know, he certainly has the stats to back it up. And easily, I think he's going to be the the conference player of the year on defense. All right, guys. Any others that might be in the field that that need to be mentioned? You know, Brandon, I, I do think it's kind of interesting. You know, we talk about. We had kind of talked about some of this stuff preseason, and you know, so, some of the names uh, that we had preseason kind of ended up falling off a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Brister, the quarterback at Lindenwood, gets hurt, um, and, and they're on their third quarterback as well, just like I mentioned with Duluth. Right. But um, you know, he he was going to be well up there in the conversation, uh, considering you know how how they've been doing. Uh, and then you also have, uh, you know, other guys like Thurow Reisdorfer at USF, who if he had been, if he had stayed healthy, he'd have been having similar years and seasons to McKellar uh, at Northwest. He would have probably been top five, six in the country rushing. Um, then you also have, uh, you know, if you, if you take a kind of a further look around, you had uh, the running back from, uh, from, from Pueblo, uh, whose name escapes me, Brandon. You, James uh, Roots. Yeah, yeah, who was. You know, we we had him on All American, and and you yeah. know he just uh, he hasn't uh, quite you know been the impact guy there that we thought he may have been, and so you know you take a look at some of those kind of names, and th those are some guys that we expected to be in the conversation. Uh, Chuck, can you think of any any others that, uh, I had a, that maybe have kind of fallen off? Yeah, I had a few. Uh, Cody Schrader, running back from Truman State, he's had a very consistent season, really good numbers. Uh, Cameron Saunders, wide receiver at Central Missouri, uh, not eye-popping in terms of total numbers of receptions, but one of the best in uh, yards per catch. So if that's something that you really value, which I do, if that's a stat you really value, 22 uh, yards per catch, 129 yards per game. So he's had a big year. Uh, a couple of defensive players, I, they, they can't win the award, but I like to mention them. I thought Chris mentioned you know one of the leading ones. Actually, Jonathan Ross from Bowie State is another one I thought would would be you know a solid contender, uh, just an outstanding defensive player. Nick Moss at, at Valdosta State has had another really big year. Um, so a couple of guys that that I've thought about. Um, I've got a whole list of kickers if I can go through those for you, Wit. Yeah, I, I, you guys, you guys haven't mentioned kickers and stuff like that in a while. It's uh, I've been missing it. Yeah, I, I totally think. <laughs> That we need to honor kickers and punters at the end of the year, and and call it the Matt Witwicky Matt Award. Wiki. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, all right, guys. Is that, that's uh, right when we also drop even, that bracket of the of the sixteen worst teams in the country and have them play it out. Right. Yep. <laughs> hey, 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 I I do want to quick, really quickly mention Bryce Witt. That was another person. Who, oh yeah. Okay. Who, yeah. who dropped off as kind of the year went on because he had the really big game at, at Bowie State and you know he I watched a, the game he dropped off. 
Right, right. So, yes, I mean, he was but, running for his life dropped off. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, he still finishes uh, his last season, you know, passing for almost 3,000 yards, has equal amount of touchdowns to to uh, to Tyson Vagent, you know. So, you know, incredible uh, career, 99 passing touchdowns to, to wow. finish off. But, uh, yeah, because he played, he played as a true freshman. Um, so it, it was incredible. You know, probably not going to get uh, consideration super high for Harlan Hill, but, you know, somebody who started off really, really hot. So, nonetheless, I mean, think about it. You're going to have a video of your hundredth touchdown pass, most likely. That's that's yeah. pretty incredible. You know, uh, you know, most most of these guys aren't going to the NFL, so that's a that's a heck of a memory to have the rest of your life. All yeah. right, guys. Yep. And I'll Let's mention switch. Uh, real quick before we oh, get out here. Yeah. Brandon, uh, T.J. Davis for Nebraska Carney. I want to just mention him real quick. Only 1,900 passing yards, but he's got another 900 yards rushing as well. The one thing that's probably a knock him, he had a big uh, showcase game versus Northwest, and they fell flat. That'll probably hurt him. Uh, big picture, if he had a big game versus Northwest and that defense, it would have helped him a lot. But they really fell flat in that game, can do anything offensively. So he's probably going to be the MIAA player of the year on offense. It just – that game's really going to hold him back for anything going for the national because he didn't they didn't perform well in that game. They got blown just, out by 50. I, so it's going to be tough I, for him I to have a hard, go past that. A he's a really good player, though. I have a hard time believing, though, that like two old, true dual threat quarterbacks outside of somebody who plays for Ferris State can win the award. It yeah. just seems like you got to rack up big yeah. stats, either rushing the football or passing the football. And, yeah. and that's what I think would be the knock on Davis winning that. Certainly mm-hmm. not a knock on him sure. as a player, but just no. in terms of the way the award play. plays out. So, um, yeah, I'm just right, he's guys. the best player in the United Blade this year. So, right. Yep. So, Let's look at the bad news from last week. So uh, no, I, no, I, did hor- I did. I did horribly. Um, wow, Chuck, Devin, you are really bad. Chuck cheated. That's why I said I'm leaving. Uh, uh, <laughs> Justin, uh, we, he was four and one when we let him go last. Clearly, we can't trust Justin's opinion because we Doesn't made him go you first. Can't do the pick him anymore? What's that? Does that mean you can't do the pick him anymore? I, Chuck, do I we have know. your wife on standby to jump in for Devin? I, I ha- <laughs> I'm, I'm completely confident she would beat us all. I, I just, I, I'm a hundred percent confident. Heck, Brandon, the cat- you, need to, you need to take all of our game checks. That's right. That's yeah, it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, guys. We're gonna have to do it this week. But uh, all right, let's look at our pick them for this week, guys. Uh, enough of that carnage. Uh, we have some great games coming up, and we will again, everybody watching, we will get to your questions. Uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, Henderson State is at Wachita Baptist. Northern State is at Minnesota Duluth. Slippery Rock is at Kutztown. Tiffin is at Finley. Valdosta State is at West Florida. All these games have conference or playoff implications. Uh, we would have done all the, the conference championship games, but we would just have seen everybody pick Bowie State. And if we would have done that, they clearly would have lost, just like Augustana lost last week. So we we, we couldn't roll with that. So uh, let's go ahead, guys. Um, I'll start, and I'm going to go in the in the order that I see them. Uh, Henderson State at Washita Baptist, uh, a mm-hmm. great rivalry game. I, I've talked about it a few times. Um, Bob Eblen and I were down there for their rivalry, and it was awesome. in in both the best and worst ways, you know, you have to, you have to, they have to put, you know, plastic over their statues. So the school, other school doesn't paint them the school colors. It's, it's, it's awesome. They're literally right across the street from each other. You know, you can see Mm -hmm. one stadium from the, from the other. It's 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 pretty incredible. They, they literally are across the street from each other and like they, they dress in their home locker rooms for the game and then just walk across the street to the opposing stadium. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Yeah, it's it's it was it was uh you know not many things surprised me in D2 but I mean, it was surprising the passion they had for that game and it was I cannot tell you how much fun I had uh going to that. The the game wasn't as good as I would like but uh uh nonetheless the experience was great. I will pick Henderson State. All right, Chris, you're next. Washington is not to be trusted. I'm going to go with Henderson State as well. Okay. Wit. 
Well, I uh, I have the answers to the quiz this week. Okay. And uh, the answer to this game is Wachita Baptist because I don't trust the Henderson State defense. Okay. Mm-hmm. Devin. Sorry, Witt. I'm also going with Wachita Baptist this week. I like their defense a little bit better than they bounced back after last week. And Henderson's been teetering on disaster the last few weeks. So I think this is the week they finally uh, fall down there. I'm going with the home team on this one. Big home field advantage. <laughs> Justin, your answer is Henderson State. (laughs) Chuck is next, so Justin still has one opportunity. I'll hold a piece of paper in the background, Justin, for your picks. We keep keep on going. Chuck, well, I I think maybe recency effect might influence me a little bit because I I watched Wachita this this morning, and they had a really rough game against Southeastern, so I'm going to go with Henderson State. Okay. And Justin... Moment of truth. Who will you pick? Don't do it. <laughs> well, I'm back and forth on this. To be to be honest, with you, I'm back and forth on it. Um, I'll give you a little help. <laughs> look, <laughs> look, last Justin time I went like last, last, I don't, I Justin like the last. So you, you should be glad that I'm going last. Justin's um, like the last kid on the playground. Nobody wants to pick him. But by the way, <laughs> just 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 to pause for a minute, Justin, I blame you completely for last week's picking debacle. Because when you pick Pueblo, it screwed up the entire panel who was who wasn't sure who to pick, and then you pick Pueblo, and they thought they had a. It, I'm just saying, but 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 continue. <laughs> I picked Pueblo well, just to go down on the commerce train, and you saw how that went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, so I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to watch it to Baptist on this one. All right, and and before we uh, uh, before we move on, guys, I wanted to share this with you and show everybody uh, that this is the this is the backside of Henderson State's press box and their stadium, mm-hmm. and then right there you can see Washita Stadium. And yeah. so, <laughs> if we were up here, you could see it even better, but it's literally that close to each it other. really so. i've i've been there brandon like you literally can't yeah. tell which campus is is which they're, right they're like it, of, it's all in, in in bad economic economic times there could be a merger and nobody would have a clue because it would just <laughs> seem like there was a, a street dividing uh, the campus do, do they both right. have home games on the same day sometimes i don't know but that would be incredible they, double header they have, we do. I, I know they have yeah that it has happened uh yeah the arcadelphia double yeah. Awesome. All right. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Brandon. New yeah. new rule. New rule. Yeah. If if it's your if it's your conference, you get to pick last on that game. Fair, uh, fair like, enough. Right before new rule. this one here. Right At this, this very one, yeah. moment, are we new, implementing new it now? Okay. New rule. We are week right, eleven. Chris, We're like, yeah, new rule. <laughs> Chris, you get to pick first. Northern State, Minnesota Duluth. <sighs> I'm I'm gonna stick with the home team. I'm gonna go with Duluth. Okay. Uh, we're going to skip Wit. Come back to him, Devin. I'm going with the home dogs as well. Give me Duluth. Okay. Chuck. Yeah, it's tempting to go with Northern here, but I, I I think Duluth is the safe pick, and I'm gonna go with them. Okay. Justin. Wait, you just want to see who I picked and go opposite. <laughs> I, I, am, I, I can't lie. I'm a little concerned right now. <laughs> I would be. Uh, no, but uh, Duluth. Okay. Matt, I have a question for you. What's the forecast? Do you have a clue? I haven't checked the, the weather for this coming week's games. No, I've uh, been, been busy in the regional rankings, to be quite honest. But um, okay. no, the, the, for what it's worth, the weather up here this week is – a little bit warmer than than it would normally be. We have 65 degrees here today. Not saying that that's going to hang around, but that's warmer gotcha. than usual this time of year. Yeah, Devin, what's up? I'm seeing Saturday in Duluth, high of 36, low of 28. So, as I was saying, it's warm. pretty warm. Yeah, it is. Consid- <laughs> For considering Canada. considering people lost, uh, can, people can lose feeling in, in appendages in Duluth when during football mm-hmm. season. So, um, you said high of 36. Yep. Clear. Not too many guys pick games based strictly on the forecast, but apparently that's where we're going here. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> I mean, when, when it's Duluth, it's not like it's the Gulf South where every day's a a, a beautiful day. It's got a little like bit of like 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 nightmares from 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 Duluth visits, huh, Brandon? <laughs> it's not like we're talking uh, about Valdosta State going up there. I mean, it's it's yeah, called it's, Northern State for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, then why is it called Midwestern State? 
that I have no answer for. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm gonna, longest, longest pick, long, longest different. pick segment ever. But yes, yes. Yeah. North, I'm going to pick Northern State. Wit, your turn. So the answer to the quiz is the Wolves of War- Northern State. I, uh, I'm, I'm taking Northern to once again show up against a very good squad. I think that they have enough offense, and I think they can protect the quarterback a little bit better than Augustana did. And I'm not sure if I can if I'm if, if I can trust Duluth to get as many turnovers, pick sixes, and big plays on defense, um, you know, with a third string quarterback. Um, now all the hate mail is going to come to me from Duluth, and I can handle it. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm I'm taking Northern here in this one. Okay, that was my thought too. That they can Duluth while a good team could not duplicate what they had done on defense and it wasn't going to be 20, uh, 30 or 20 degrees in sleet you know yes. so no northern could move the ball that's why i was curious slippery rock at kutztown and as the former psac columnist chuck i'm going to let you go last just that just to honor you uh this week wit you go first though i got a chance to watch both squads uh this last weekend Chuck will be proud of me. I spent a few hours watching some action outside of my my own. And uh, in what I saw, I'm going to go with Slippery Rock. I I like the bubble screens and a lot of what they do offensively. And uh, I wasn't terribly impressed with Kutztown on their game. So uh, I'm going with the Rock here. Okay. Uh, Devin. Well, I picked against the Rock last week, and it burned me for my 0-5 weeks. I'm going to take the Rock this week, and hopefully things turn a little bit for me. Okay. Okay. Justin. (laughs) <laughs> all right justin i'm almost positive i took slipper rock last week so i'm gonna stick with them again this week and take them again sorry wit that's okay i i, I forgot devin devin's kind of the guy now so you're off the hot seat <laughs> uh bad. so bad I, i'm gonna i'm gonna pick slippery rock as well i have not been uh, Kutztown keeps winning, but I have not been that impressed with them all year. You know, you, you know, as good as Jim Clements might be, I have not been uh, that impressed with them. Uh, Chuck playing poker down there, not giving away anything with his facial expression. Yeah, no kidding. Chris, Chris. Yeah, <sighs> Slavery Rock's kind of tough because they, they really don't have these signature wins outside of the California deal. And Kutztown has been playing in a fairly rugged um, East. So I'm going to go with Cutdown on here. Okay. Chuck, you're last. Uh, I'm glad somebody went with Cutdown because I think they deserve for to, for a pick to come out of this panelist because I think that they're better than than a lot of people think they are. Um, they have a really good defense. I'm concerned that they're not going to have quite enough offense. If this gets high scoring, uh, if it gets even into the low 30s, I'm not sure that Cutdown keeps pace. Um, home game for them. They've had really good turnout in late November for big games. I think they'll have a great crowd there that works in their favor, but I do think Slippery Rock wins this game. All right. Tiffin is at Finley. We are going to start with Devin. I'm going to go with Tiffin on this one. I think Finley's better than the beginning of the year, but Tiffin still gets the win here. Okay. Chuck? Uh, I'm going to go Finley. Justin? Tiffin on the road. Okay. I'm going to go with Tiffin as well. Uh, Chris. Tiffin. Okay. Matt. Yeah, I've been on the Tiffin train all year. I'm sticking with it here. Okay. And the last game this week, Justin gets to pick last because it is Valdosta State and West Florida. Uh, I think the Grand Valley Ferris game, was the first game of the year, but I think this one's slightly better. And this is probably, in my opinion, the game of the year in the country this year. Uh, Very much looking forward to it. Uh, Chuck picks first. West Florida has come through for me a lot in big games, and I think that they're going to surprise some people, and they are going to win this game. Okay. Um, I would be next. I'm going to go with Valdosta. Okay, Chris. I don't want to pick either one. I want them both to lose. 
um, but Boy, I, just hating, just hating. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but uh, all in all, uh, if I'm going to go with somebody, I'm going to go with uh, the 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 one team that I think can not only just beat West Florida, but go all the way too. And uh, I'm going to go to Austin here. Okay, Matt. I uh, I favor Valdosta because I just think their defense is a notch better. Okay. Um, I think both teams are very, very good offensively. And uh, I, I'm taking Valdosta. All right. Devin. Okay, so I think Valdosta is probably the best team in the nation. But in the Gulf South, weird things happen, especially on the road. I don't really like West Florida's defense, but I think Austin Reed's the best player on the field, and I usually go with that. So I'm going to go with West Florida uh, with the upset win here over Valdosta. It should be a fantastic football game. You like offense, I think you're being in store for a good one. Okay, fair enough. And Justin. So this is probably the game that everybody, especially in the Gulf South, has had circled for a long time now. Um, and and I think the last couple of weeks, it's hard to not be eyeing this game. I, I think the, the yes. chess match to me in this one is gonna be the the Valdosta defense versus Austin Reed and the West Florida offense. I mean, there's no doubt that West Florida can score and they can score in a hurry. Their only hiccup was uh, was West Georgia earlier this year. Uh, and, and so I, I don't – it is what it is. Like you said, the Gulf South, you, you tend to have just – crazy things tend to happen. So uh, I, this is going to be a high – I think it has the potential to be a high-scoring game. I think, that, like I said, the chess match or the, the difference maker is going to be Ken Valdosta State's defense, slow down Austin Reed in that offense. Uh, and I think they will. I think uh, I, I don't. I think the the Valdosta o- offense matches up well with the West Florida defense. So mm-hmm. I'm going to take Valdosta in this one. I, I think it's going to be a high scoring affair. But but I think Valdosta's defense is going to come up with some key stops down the stretch to to to, to get this one. I think as long as they make the playoffs, West Florida has to like the fact that we're picking against them. At least the majority have picked against them. They have never won a playoff game that they've hosted. Is that in that right? Chuck? They've they've never played a home playoff game. Oh, okay. They okay, have. very good. So, well, so I get this set up. So, so yeah, that's, right. that's correct. So th- well, this set up correct. a couple years ago. Valdosta beat them in the regular season, and they played in the postseason. And, and West Florida got them on the way to the national right. championship. So, that's right. you Thank know, you. these two teams are are very accustomed to playing each other, especially late in the season, and. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that when you're looking big picture to, to to both West Florida and Valdosta, this is just another game. You know, to us, this is a big game. To everybody else in the Gulf South, it's a big game. But to them, yeah, it's a big game, and they want to win it for a lot of reasons. But I see both those teams making the playoffs, and so it's it's all about building, going for that bigger picture. And, and so I, I think if you – I think both these teams will come out of it better and stronger, which is – bodes well for the postseason for both teams. Justin, Wait, I think what's a lot the of people can like see this as a up. regional final too. I mean, I, I, I think you could see this as a regional yeah. final, not just you know playing playing this in this game. All right. Absolutely. Okay, so, let's so, tack. Yeah, let's... I got a question real quick. Justin, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Justin, uh, if I yeah. also loses this game, and I'm not asking this because I'm being selfish here, but if I also <laughs> loses this game, do they stay the one seed? Yeah, the numbers are going to be supporting that. Very yeah. possible. Okay. That's a great question. Yeah. I I can't give you an answer to that because I really truly don't know. I don't know what will happen. If, if Inkblot's still in the chat, he can reply. But I I the, there's there's the Valdosta's strength of schedule is gonna be super high. I think and the I, number I, think I agree I think with it's gonna happen. I think the numbers would at least support the argument that a one loss team with Valdosta's resume still gets the number one, even if Bowie state is the lone undefeated in the region, but we don't know that the committee will, will look at it that way. They might look at it and just say, we have an 11 and O team. If it's Bowie state 11 and O they're number one. We don't know which way they'll go. I was just curious. Cause I, I just wonder if that maybe takes a little bit of edge off this game. Um, if if not also states not going to lose the one seed if they lose, so. I don't know if they can look at it with a level of certainty, right? Um, well, well, and, and and you know, Inkblot just mentioned he he agrees with me, and I mean, why wouldn't he? Of course, well, but I want to um, ask Justin about this. Even like let's let's ignore the playoffs, even though that scenario could play out. How important is it for a coach to win a conference championship? I I don't think any this, coach. Yeah, go ahead. 
Please. No, I, this game, it, the, the playoffs are not I, – I don't think that's on the forefront of anybody's mind because they are what they right. are. The numbers are what they are, and, yeah. and they're going to get seated where they get seated. But what's more important, I think, to these coaches and these programs is winning for a lot of reasons. First is probably bragging rights, you know, is, hey, we we are the better team between these two because they're both compared. You know, when you start talking about the number one team in the Gulf, it's, it's those two teams right now. And so it's just, who's the better just, team. Isn't this but a prove-it also, game? I mean, like the prove it game. I think so. Well, I think it's big on that. I think it's big on recruiting. You know what I mean? Like they're they're yeah, both true. fighting for. I think a lot of the same kids, and they're you know. And so you, this is a big recruiting game. I think for for both these programs, you yeah. win. You can you, you have three hundred sixty five days of bragging rights and recruiting when you're out on the road to say, yeah, we're you know we're better than that program. We beat them. You know, so uh, I think there's a and lot. And who's Valdosta's last loss? Who's the last loss for Valdosta? West Florida yeah, playoffs. West 19. Florida. So yeah, I don't think I don't yeah. think the motivation is going to be lacking here. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, and I don't think. And, and to be honest with you, as a coach, you don't the the playoffs. They're not even in your mind. You know what? Your mind is is what happens Saturday because I promise you both the the communities, the alumni, the boosters for both programs are there saying, "Hey, we we want to win this game." You know, what I mean, like it. it I'm sure people are coming out of the woodworks to get tickets to this game because it's going to be packed. It's going to be, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's again, the bragging rights are there and it's, I think there's a little bit of a, a chip on both of their shoulders to, you know, and especially I think on West Florida, you know, because of the slip up with West Georgia, you know, that loss I think is, is they, they want to prove that it was just a bad day. And West Florida's never won the the Gulf South Conference championship. I don't know if we've been, mentioned Correct. that, but it's true, right? Right. right. Yep. All right. Well, let's look at comments. Hey, and yeah, one second, Brandon. Before we go on, yeah. it's going to be a chilly sixty three degrees in Pensacola, Florida, on Saturday. So I'm sure the people in Florida bring their winter coats and stuff like that to the game. It'd be a little ten degrees cooler than they're usual too down they, there. So. They they might. <laughs> uh, I've seen some wimpy fans. So uh, well, forty seven. So I mean, it's pretty chilly for them so, down there. Hey, you know, in all fairness, we talked about this. Valdosta State's the one that's gone north and had no problems, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in in the playoffs. But I I want to I want to see this just because it made me laugh. First, Tender Man said, "Another week of confirmation that this season's NSIC is drunk." <laughs> so I, I just thought I thought that yeah. that was uh, that was very funny. So it's going to take us a while. There are so many comments today and so many side. Uh, conversations going, um, Brandon. While you're com- while you're combing the comments, yeah, there, let, let me ask a, a question uh, of Justin since he's got experience coaching at different levels. Because we just talked about you know the conference championship. Um, in my experience talking with coaches, winning the conference champions is usually the number one goal that they go in with. You know, we because everything else happens after that. Yes, we want to win a national championship. We want to get the playoffs. Winning the conference championship is always the first step to get there. So, I mean, what what do you think about just looking at this from you know fulfilling a goal for those teams, and not just even you know, the two teams we were just talking about, but it's in contention to win a conference championship this weekend? You know, when, when you set out and you start, you, when you set your goals going into the season, a conference championship is is typically it may not be the first one. Um, you, you know, you, you typically say you want to win the first game and when the, right. when the games are supposed to, but a conference championship is there. That this is the first step for the rest of the season. You know, this is the first step winning a conference championship because at the end of the day, everybody but one team loses their their last game, right? Like yeah. everybody's going to lose their last game except for one team in the country. So for for a lot of people, this is a big win. It's a big win for a lot of reasons because you. First of all, what you're doing and all the off-season works, the off-season workouts, the summer conditioning, all that stuff, th- this is kind of the proving ground that what you're doing is working. You know, you win a conference championship, you're the best team in your conference. It usually has a lot of uh, – in college, it usually has a lot of recruiting implications because a lot of times geographically you're recruiting against the same teams in your conference. And so this has that, that little bit of an edge of the conference championship. Everybody wants to go and, and play for a conference champion. So it gives you a little bit of edge in the recruiting game. Uh, and then it, it does set you up. I'm sorry. Gravitas. Oh, and and then and then the other thing is, I think that if you win the conference, there's a lot of things like you you can control you control what you can control, right? Like control the controllables. So you're going to win the conference. You can control that. What happens with the playoffs? With your playoff seating, all that. A lot of times that's out of your control. 
right? Like you can't control what seed you get, the, the, the path to the national championship, the weather, any of that. You can't control any of that. So you control what you can control, and the first thing you can control is winning a conference championship, and then you just trust that the process that you have in place takes care of the rest. All right. First question. It's directed towards Chris, but after Chris gives his opinion, anybody else feel free to chime in. Uh, if West Georgia and Lenore Ryan happen to stumble, would you put Savannah State or Fayetteville State in the seven slot? Savannah State has a little bit better resume than Fayetteville State. I mean, the the, the thing about Fayetteville is they got to beat Bowie. If they beat right. Bowie, and you know, if they beat Bowie, then then yes, they're in the seven slot. Savannah State's idle right now, so um, that that question kind of goes away with what happens in the CIW championship game. So a question for any of us, has the rock gotten that much better since their opening three point win versus Wayne state, which they were honestly quite fortunate to win. I think Wayne's gotten worse. I think so. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think we might be right, but yeah. And, and, and that's what good, that's what good programs do. Right. I mean, we're talking week one versus week 11. That's, that's what good teams do. Yeah. I think they're probably a, a lot better than they were back then. Well, they want a new quarterback, and well, they they've now moved to a different quarterback, and so I mean they're they're they're, they're quite a bit different team than that at that point. I mean, when you consider everything else, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, it's almost a full season ago. So, All right, uh, Chuck, with Cal and Bentley losing, does this open the door for Ship to get to get a top seven? Well, maybe, but I kind of actually look at that a little bit differently because, you know, it's it's such a log jam in Super Region 1 right now, and, and I'm not sure that Bentley losing was good for a team like Shippensburg. I think right. if, if New Haven loses that game, now that's a two-loss team that you really can compare directly to, to the resume of a team like Shippensburg or, or Charleston. That's another team that, we t- that was uh, mentioned in the chat as well. So I think it actually would have been better – for, for that to go the other way and, and potentially even better for Cal to, to beat uh, Slippery Rock. Right. And make right. them a two loss team as well. Um, so I, I don't think that that was actually good for them at all. Shippensburg is still there. They're, they're, they're in, they're in the picture, but I think that they would need a lot of craziness to, to sneak in there. All right. Here's a comment. It, uh, help me figure it out. Cause it, uh, Bradley Damron, it's crazy to think that a one loss Cal may be sitting at home but he thinks that's going to happen. Would that involve earn access? Is that how that would happen? Well, it could, you know, if they okay. fall down to, to seventh and you know, the GMAC get, gets a bid through earned access, it could. Um, I, th- I think that they'll probably be there um, as a one loss team, but that, you know, as we just mentioned, it's, it's really tight. So, but we'll see. There, there's always some craziness that can happen in this last week of the season. Um, you know, Cal still has to win. They, they, they've got a very winnable game, but they, they still have to win that on, on Saturday. So I think they, they, they should be okay, but um, earned access could, could bump them out. And, and I'd, I'd hate to see a one loss team not make the playoffs. It, it has Newman. happened before Carson Newman, you know, it happened yeah. to them, but I'd hate to see it. So let's, uh, anybody can answer this one. How strong would a theoretical combination of the three GNAC teams and Lone Star be? Doesn't hurt. I mean, with central Washington and sometimes Western Oregon can have some decent teams, but uh, it can't hurt. Uh, will it be stronger than some of the other conference alignments that we have? You know, the RMAC, the NSIC? Uh, I don't know about that. Um, I would like to see it just because we would be able to get a, I don't know, a little bit better picture or resume on on a team like a Central Washington, for example. You know, if, yeah. if, if we go ahead and we're not seeing teams – that like the Simon Frazier's that they're playing twice and others like that, where it's like, okay, let's, let, let's see a little bit how they would do up and down against, you know, a, a much more capable slate, frankly. Right. The problem I think is that, you know, with the travel that's needed right. to execute something right. like that. I mean, you're just taking resources out of the program too. Right. Yeah. There was a, there was an interesting discussion on the message board this week about uh, something that I had thought of, and then somebody added to it. I had often thought, if the NCAA would allow us to play a week earlier, like than we do now, that theoretically somebody could schedule like 
let's just take Central Washington. They fly to Texas. They play uh, Angelo one week, stay the entire week, play so and so the next week. Uh, there, there could be resources. Uh, this person is involved in aviation, and they talked about if you schedule that far enough, you can actually get uh, commercial tickets, which saves you tons of money because a charter's ninety thousand right. to a hundred thousand right now. And you can and, do some creative things where other schools host them to save some money. Correct. Yes. Like empty dorms and stuff like that. Right. If, 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 in my opinion, if it's, if it's the difference between playing and not playing between having, not having to play teams again, I think it's worth mm-hmm. doing that, but you know, it, it may be too uh, out of the box thinking for some. Right. People. Well, we saw right. this um, actually in the Southeast in 2018, I think when one of the big hurricanes came through and really just That's wreaked right. havoc. Uh, Chris, Justin, That's you guys right. might remember this uh, Florence. I think it was just wreaked havoc. Mm-hmm. A lot of teams got displaced and did exactly that. You know, they, they traveled. Like I know the Citadel went and stayed at, at uh, North Greenville um, coastal Carolina went up and stayed at um, Campbell. Uh, played games there and then actually stayed, you know, uh, it, there for you know, a week or so uh, because they couldn't get back to their campus. So there's there's opportunities to do that. I would love to see something like that for the GNAC teams because I just want those teams to stay <laughs> stay healthy. Right, it's a exactly. really tough existence for them. Yep. All right. So I don't have an uh, an answer for this because I think recruiting is very. Regional, but what's uh, what are the opinions of the D two football scene in Maryland with Bowie and Frostburg? Are they making it harder for PSAC and MEC teams to get recruits out of there? No, you don't think Maryland, so. I don't think so. So actually, if you look at rosters in the MEC, a lot of those teams actually go to like the DMV area, um, DC, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, Bowie State actually, what they kind of get is some of the some of the kids go out there and they don't like it. So they come back and they have a home um, when they come back to places like Bowie State. So like b- bounce back kids. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And this is even on the division two level, right? right so, right. so I mean, you know, Frostburg coming in in division two, I think certainly makes it even more competitive because <laughs> those kids don't have to go out as far as West Virginia. Um, but no, I don't really think it makes it that much harder, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm still looking through, guys. There's so many There's so many uh, comments and questions. If you guys uh, see uh, any, I'll throw out just a couple since we yeah. talked about uh, Frostburg, just to confirm Frostburg's not eligible for the playoffs yet. Uh, we wish they were because they're having such an awesome season. Um, somebody asked a question about which super region does SR does the SR2 champion play? Um, as a reminder, this started a couple of years ago. Um, once we're down to the final four, those four teams are reseeded. So we don't have a completely mm-hmm. static bracket like we used to back in the old days where, you know, we already knew which regions were going to play, which regions. Right. So we won't actually know that until we get down to the final four. Okay. Yep. We already talked about this a little bit, touched on it. We think Valdosta would be number one still. Is that what we were saying? I, I'm not I do totally here. sure that, that the committee would go that direction. I, I think it, there's definitely a good argument. I'm just not completely sure that they would go that direction. Chuck, you and I are betting a Dairy Queen If we next time I see you, if that happens. All right. Is there any Matt. chance that the – oh, go ahead. Matt, did you have another sarcastic No, no, no. I'm comment? sorry. No. Okay, okay. No, no. Uh, Me, any, no, huh? No, <laughs> never. Uh, is there a chance that Slippery Rock – somehow falls out of the playoffs with a loss in the title game. I think the head to head would keep them above Cal, but you never know. What is everybody's opinion? I I don't think so. Their their SOS is going to take a, a nice jump because they've got they they just played Cal. Uh Kutztown's nine and one. Um could it maybe I, but I don't think so. I, th- I think I think it's not beyond the realm of possibility by any means. I mean, you'd be a two-loss squad at that point. I realize the SOS bump, but I don't know if they're going to be seen in the same light as Cal, one loss versus two, even with the head-to-head. But that, it would be very interesting if that did play out, yeah. Yeah, I think Inkblot said here that they really haven't punished the, PAs, the PSAC champion loser 
in the regional rankings as much in the past. So it's one thing to keep in mind. All right. Still looking for questions, guys, because there's so many comments. Having to sort through the comments to find the question. It's mostly just Chris's fan club posting in here. Well, no um, wonder it's it's just like <laughs> spinning, you know. Uh, all right. Have we gotten Chris's beer to Twitter handle yet? Uh, we do now. I got <laughs> right. Uh, let's, let's, let's first follow let's, a Chuck's cat, right? That's right. Uh, here, here's a couple um, couple names that got thrown out when we were talking about Harlan Hill. Ivy Durham. We actually talked about him a little bit last week. Yeah, we did. Um, yep. Justin, we talked about him. Guam Lee, linebacker from Notre Dame College. Outstanding yep. player. Probably an All-American. Not going to be a Harlan Hill finalist, but probably going to be an All-American. He's a, he's a great player. Really fun to watch. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Ed Easton, that same discussion, said he thinks it should be an MVP of one of the top eight teams. Not sure if you want to do it that way, but sometimes it kind of works itself out to be in that way in the end. So I'm not sure this is a comment that was put out there. Okay. Um, I think wow. the running back was also mentioned, uh, you know, given his career, but you know, he's putting up a lot of touchdowns this year, but he's not, I mean, I don't even know if he's at a thousand yards yet. And he Cole was about, for Harding. yeah, he was at five yards of carry and that, that just, um, you, you, you won't get the, the, I mean, let, let's be real frank guys. If you're going to be a running back or quarterback, frankly, any of these positions, your stats have to be just video game mm -hmm. numbers. And that's yeah, the reality. A full back yeah, I mean, that's the reality of it. Yep. Yeah. Flexible, whatever. Uh, have we discussed this? Have we, can uh, we see a one loss Cal? I know we touched on a little bit. Yeah, we just talked mm -hmm. about that. Okay, okay. Um, um, wow. Golly, geez, there's lots of. Anderson and OBU did not have the same game, the same home games this year. It was all alternating. So. So I, that earlier. I know that it has happened. I don't think it happens a lot, but I know that it, it has happened. There's a, a okay. A, a, there's a, re a reporter that I won't name Brandon, but there's a reporter that used to work for a news outlet that doesn't exist anymore, who did the uh, did the Arkadelphia double. Gotcha. Yeah, he, think, he didn't understand I think with, that to him, but he he did it. <laughs> I think with the all gag like schedule in, internal now, they can kind of get it to where they're alternating weekends better at this point than when they had out of conference games. All right. Yeah, all cool. right, guys. I think that's all the questions. So uh, lots of comments. Appreciate everybody joining us this week. Uh, this was this was a heck of a show. There was a ton to talk about, and uh, uh, we did that. So uh, I want to thank some things, uh, some people before we leave. Thanks to Paul Falowitz, the, the dean of D2 columnist, uh, for joining us. Coach Damon Wilson, Coach Sean Lutz, thank you both for joining us. Uh PSAC Digital Network, WIBW 13, and the Charger Sports Network uh, for use of the video. Uh, we had 64 games simultaneous this week. Uh, so, uh, again, Nick Palmer and Sam Robert did a great job on the scores. Very, very appreciative of their efforts. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, you see the button in the lower right. Again, tell your friends about us. You are our, our marketing team. Uh, next week, we will have a reaction to the playoffs. The NCAA uh, will have the stream and the selection sometime 4 or 5 o'clock Central Time, so 5 or 6 Eastern, uh, whenever that comes out. We will come on a regularly scheduled time and react to what happened. Uh, give us a we'll, – we'll need, you know, a few a few minutes to dissect it. Uh, maybe talk with our good friend Inkblot, but uh, if you want to come in and complain or come in and celebrate or uh, whatever, please join us next week. Uh, but uh, until then, uh, I'd like to thank you guys, uh, all of you, uh, for supporting us and uh, for supporting uh, D2 Football. And uh, we will see you next week at uh, 7 p.m. for uh, Inside D2 Football. Thanks. Thanks.